The Regeneration of Lord Ernie From Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Patrick 79 The Regeneration of Lord Ernie Part 1 John Hendricks was bear-leading at the time. He had originally studied for holy orders, but had abandoned church later for private reasons, connected with his faith, and had taken to teaching and tutoring instead. He was an honest, upstanding fellow of five-and-thirty, incorruptible, intelligent in a simple, straightforward way. He played games with his head, more than most Englishmen do, but he went through life without much calculation. He had qualities that made boys like and respect him. He won their confidence. Poor, proud, ambitious, he realized that fate offered him a chance when the Secretary of State of Scotland asked him if he would give up his other pupils for a year, and take his son, Lord Ernie, round the world upon an educational trip that might make a man of him. For Lord Ernie was his only son, and the Marquess's influence was naturally great. To have deposited a regenerated Lord Ernie at the castle gates might have guaranteed Hendricks's future. After leaving Eton prematurely, the lad had come under Hendricks's charge for a time, and with such excellent results. I simply swear by that chap, you know, a boy used to say, and his father, considerably impressed and rather as a last resort, had made this proposition. And Hendricks, without much calculation, had accepted it. He liked Bindy for himself. It was in his heart to make a man of him, if possible. They had now been round the world together, and had come up from Brindisi to the Italian lakes, and so into Switzerland and it was the middle of October. With a week or two to spare, they were making leisurely for the ancestral halls of Aberdeenshire. The nine months' travel, Hendricks realized with keen disappointed, had accomplished, however, very little. The job had been exhausting, and he had conscientiously done his best. Lord Ernie liked him thoroughly, admiring his vigour with a smile of tolerant good-nature through his ceaseless cigarette-smoke. They were almost like two boys together. "'Oh, you are a chap and a half, Mr. Hendricks. You really ought to be in the cabinet with my father.' Hendricks would deliver up his useless parcel at the castle gates, pocket the thanks and the hard-earned fee, and go back to his arduous life of teaching and writing in dingy lodgings. It was a pity, even on the lowest grounds. The tutor, to tell the truth, felt undeniably depressed. Hopeful by nature, optimistic too, as men of action usually are, he cast about him, even at the last hour, for something that might stir the boy to life, to wake him up, put zest and energy into him. But there was only Paris now between them and the end. And Paris certainly could not be relied upon for help. Bindi's desire for Paris even was not strong enough to count. No desire in him was ever strong. And there lay the crux of the problem in a word. Lord Ernie was without desire, which is life. Tall, well-built, handsome, he was yet such a feeble creature, without the energy to be either wild or vicious. 
languid, yet certainly not decadent, life ran slowly, flabbily with him. He took to nothing. The first impression he made was fine, and then nothing. His only tastes, if tastes they could be called, were out-of-door tastes. He was vaguely interested in flying, yet not enough to master the mechanism of it. He liked motoring at high speeds, being driven, not driving himself. And he loved to wander about in woods, making fires like a red Indian, provided they lit easily, yet even this, not for the poetry of the thing, nor for any love of adventure, but just because. I like fire, you know. I like to watch it burn. Heat seemed to give him curious satisfaction. Perhaps because the heat of life, he realized, was deficient in his six-foot body. It was significant, this love of fire in him, though no one could discover why. As a child he had dangerous delight in fireworks, anything to do with fire. He would watch a candle flame as though he were a fire-worshipper, but had never been known to make a single remark of interest about it. In a wood, as mentioned, the first thing he did was to gather sticks, though the resulting fire was never part of any purpose. He had no purpose. There was no wind or fire of life in the lad at all. The fine body was inert. Hendricks did wrong, of course, in going where he did, to this little desolate village in the Jura Mountains, though it was the first time all these trying months he had allowed himself a personal desire. But from Domo de Sola the Simplon Express would pass Lausanne, and from Lausanne to the Jura was but a step. All on the way home, moreover, and what prompted him was merely a sentimental desire to revisit the place where ten years before he had fallen violently in love with the pretty daughter of the pasteur, Monsieur Lesin, in whose house he lodged. He had gone there to learn French. The very slight detour seemed pardonable. His spiritless charge was easily persuaded. We might go home by Pontalier, instead of Ballet, and get a glimpse of the Jura, he suggested. The line slides along its frontiers a bit, and then goes bang across it. We might even stop off a night on the way, if you cared about it. I know a curious old village, Villeray, where I went at your age to pick up French. Topple, replied Lord Ernie listlessly, all on the way to Paris, ain't it? Of course. You see, there's a fortnight before we need to get home. So there is, yes. Oh, let's go. He felt almost as though it was his own idea, and that he decided it. If you'd really like it. Oh, yes, why not? I'm sick of cities. He flicked some dust off the coat sleeve with an immaculate silk handkerchief, then lit a cigarette. "'Just as you like,' he added with a drawl and a smile. "'I am ready for anything.' There was no keenness, no personal desire, no choice in reality at all. Flabby good nature, merely. A suggestion was invariably enough, as though the boy had no will of his own, his opposition really more than negative sulking that soon flattened out because it was forgotten. Indeed, no sign of positive life lay in him anywhere. No vitality, aggression, coherence of desire, and will. Vacuous rather than imbecile, unable to go forward upon any definite line of his own, as though all wheels had slipped their cogs. A pasty soul that took good enough impressions, 
yet never mastered them for permanent use. Nothing stuck. He would never make a politician, much less a statesman. The family title would be borne by a nincompoop. Yet all the machinery was there, one felt, if only it could be driven, made to go. It was sad. Lord Ernie was heir to great estates, with a name and position that might influence thousands. And Hendricks had been a good selection, with his virility and gentle understanding firmness. He understood the problem. I will do what no one else could, the anxious father told him, for he worships you, and you can sting without hurting him. You'll put life and interest into him if anybody in this world can. I have great hopes for this tour. I shall always be in your debt, Mr. Hendricks. And Hendricks had accepted the onerous duty in his big, high-minded way. But he was conscientious to the backbone. This little side trip was his sole deflection, if such it can be called even. Life! light and cheerful influences had been his instructions nothing dull or melancholy an occasional fling if he wants it i'd welcome a fling as a good sign and as much intercourse with decent people and stimulating sight-seeing as you can manage or can stand the marquis added with a smile only you won't overtax the lad will you above all let him think he chooses and decides when possible villaret however hardly complied with these conditions there was melancholy in it hendrix's mind whose reflexes the sponge nature of the empty lad absorbed too easily would be in a minor key yet a knight could work no harm Whence came, he wondered, the fleeting notion that it might do good? Was it, perhaps, that Lazan, the vigorous old pastor, might contribute something? Lazan had been a considerable force in his own development, he remembered. They had corresponded a little. Lazan was out of the common, certainly, restless energy in him as of the sea. Hendricks found difficulty in sorting out his thoughts and motives, but Lazan was in there somewhere. This idea that his energetic personality might help, his vitalizing effect at least would counteract the melancholy. For Villaret lay huddled upon unstimulating slopes, the robe of gloomy pine woods sweeping down towards its poverty from bleak heights and desolate gorges. The peasants were morose, ill-living folk. It was a dark, untaught corner in a range of otherwise fairy mountains, a backwater the sun had neglected to clean out. Superstitions, Hendricks remembered, of incredible kind still lingered there. A touch of the sinister hovered about the composite minds of its inhabitants. The pastor fought strenuously this blackness in their lives and, and their thoughts, in the village itself with more or less success, though even there the drinking and habits of living were utterly unsweetened. But on the heights, among the somewhat arid pastures, the mountain men remained untamed, turbulent, even menacing. Hendricks knew this of old, though he had never understood too well, but he remembered how the English boys at Le Cure were forbidden to climb in certain directions, because the life in these scattered chalets was somehow loose and violent. There was danger there. The danger, however, never definitely stated. Those lonely ridges lay cursed beneath dark skies. He remembered, too, the savage dogs, the difficulty of approach, the aggressive attitude towards a plucky pastor's visits to these remote upland pâturages. 
they did not lay in his parish. Lazan made his occasional visits as a man and missionary. For extraordinary rumours Hendricks recalled were rife of some queer worship of their own these lawless peasants kept alive in their distant, windy territory, planted there first, the story had it, by some renegade priest, whose name was now forgotten. Hendricks himself had no personal experiences. He had been too deeply in love to trouble about the outside things, however strange. But Marston's case had never quite left his memory. Marston, who climbed up by unlawful ways, stayed away two whole days and nights, and came back suddenly with his air of being broken, shattered, appallingly used up. His face, so lined and strained, it seemed as though it had aged by twenty years, and yet with a singular new life in him, so vehement, loud, and reckless, it was like a kind of sober intoxication. Oh, he was packed off to England before he could relate anything. But he had suffered shocks. His white, passionate face, his boisterous new vigour, the way Monsieur Lezanne screened his view of the heights as he put him personally into the parish train, almost as though he feared the boy would see the hills and make another dash for them made up an unforgettable picture in the mind. Moreover, between the sodden village and that string of evil chalets that lay in their dark line upon the heights, there had been links, exactly of what nature he never knew, for love made all else uninteresting. Only he remembered swarthy, dark-faced messengers descending into the sleepy hamlet from time to time. Big, mountain-limbed fellows with wind in their hair and fire in their eyes. That their visits produced commotion and excitement of difficult kinds. That wild orgies invariably followed in their wake, and that when the messengers went back they did not go alone. There was life up there, whereas the village was moribund, and none who went ever cared to return. Coudrevan, the young giant vigneron, taken in his way from the very side of his sweetheart too, came back two years later as a messenger himself. He did not even ask for the girl, who had meanwhile married another. "'There's life there with us,' he told the drunken loafers in the Guilliam Tell, Wind and fire to make you spin to the devil, or to heaven. He was enthusiasm personified. In the village he had been merely drinking himself stupidly to death. Vaguely, too, Hendrik remembered visits of police from the neighbouring town. Some of them on horseback, but all of them were armed, and that once even soldiers accompanied them and on another occasion a bishop, and whatever the church dignitary was called, had arrived suddenly and promised radical assistance of a spiritual kind that had never materialized. Oh, and many other details that now troop back with suggestions time had certainly not made smaller. For the love had passed along its way and gone, and he was free now to the invasion of other memories, dwarfed at the time by that dominating sweet passion. Yet all the tutor wanted now, this chance week in late October, was to see again the corner of the mossy forest where he had known that marvellous thing, first love. Renew his link with Lazan, who had taught him much, and see if, perchance, this man's stalwart, virile energy might possibly overflow with benefit into his listless charge. The expenses he meant to pay out of his own pocket. Those wild pagans on the heights, even if they still exist, 
there was no need to mention. Lord Ernie knew little French, and certainly no word of patois. For one night, or even two, the risk was negligible. Was there indeed risk at all of any sort? Was not this vague uneasiness he felt merely conscience, faintly pricking? He could not feel that he was doing wrong. At worst, the youth might feel depression for a few hours, speedily curable by taking the train. Something, nevertheless, did gnaw at him in subconscious fashion, producing a sense of apprehension, and he came to the conclusion that this memory of the mountain tribe was the cause of it, a revival of forgotten boyhood's awe. He glanced across at the figure of Bindi, lounging upon the hotel lawn in an easy chair, full in the sunshine, a newspaper at his feet. Reclining there, he looked so big and strong and handsome, yet in reality was but a painted lath without resistance, much less attack in all his many inches. And suddenly the tutor recalled another thing. The link, however undiscoverable, and it was this, that the boy's mother, a Canadian, had suffered once severely from a winter in Quebec, where the Marquis had first made her acquaintance. Frost had robbed her, if he remembered rightly, of a foot, with the result, at any rate, that she had a wholesome terror of the cold. She sought heat and sun instinctively. Fire! Also, that asthma had been her sole affliction, sheer inability to take a full deep breath. This deficiency of heat and air, therefore, were in his mind, and he knew that Bindi's birth had been an anxious time. The anxiety justified, moreover, since she had yielded up her life for him. And so the singular thought flashed through him suddenly as he watched the reclining, languid boy, Kudrivan's descriptive phrase oddly singing in his head. Heat and fire, fire and wind, why, it's the very thing he lacks, and he's always after them. I wonder... End of part one of story one. Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick seventy nine. Story one The Regeneration of Lord Ernie. Part two. The lumbering yellow diligence brought them up from the lake shore, a long two hours, deposited them at the opening of the village street, and went its grinding, toiling way towards the frontier. They arrived in a blur of rain. It was evening. Lowering clouds drew night before her time upon the world obscuring the distant summits of the Oberland. But lights twinkled here and there in the nearer landscape, mapping the gloom with signals. The village was very still. Above and below it, however, two big winds were at work, with curious results. For a lower wind from the east, in gusty draughts, drove the body of the lake into quick white horses which shone like wings against the deep Bassus Alps, while a westerly current swept the heights immediately above the village. There was an odd division of two weathers, presaging a change. A narrow line of clear bright sky showed up the Jura outline finely towards the north stars peeping sharply through the pale moist spaces. 
hurrying vapours, driven by the upper westerly wind, concealed them thinly. They flashed and vanished. The entire ridge, five thousand feet in the air, had the appearance of moving through the sky. Between these opposing winds, at different levels, the village itself lay motionless, while the world slid past, as it were, in two directions. "'The earth seems to be turning round,' remarked Lord Ernie. He had been reading a novel all day in train and steamer, and smoking endless cigarettes in the diligence, his companion and himself its only occupants. He seemed suddenly to have waked up. "'What is it?' he asked with interest. Hendricks explained the queer effect of the two contrary winds. Columns of peat smoke rose in thin straight lines from the blur of houses, untouched by the careering currents above and below. The winds whirled round them. Lord Ernie listened attentively to the explanation. "'Oh, I feel like I was spinning with it, like a top,' he observed, putting his hands to his head for a moment. "'And what are those lights up there?' He pointed to the distant ridge, where fires were blazing as though stars had fallen and set fire to the trees. Several were visible at regular intervals. The sharp summits of the limestone mountains cut hard into the clear spaces of northern sky thousands of feet above. "'Oh, the, the peasants burning wood and stuff, I suppose,' the tutor told him. The youth turned an instant, standing still to examine them with a shading hand. "'People live up there?' he asked. There was surprise in his voice and his body stiffened oddly as he spoke. "'Oh, in mountain chalets, yes,' replied the other, a trifle impatiently, noticing his attitude. "'Oh, come along now,' he added. "'Let's get to our rooms in the carpenter's house before the rain comes down. "'You can see the windows twinkling over there,' and he pointed to the building near the church. "'The storm will catch us!' They moved quickly down the deserted street together in the deepening gloom, passing little gardens, doors of open barns, straggling manure heaps, and courtyards of cobbled stones where the occasional figure of a man was seen. But Lord Ernie lingered behind, half loitering. Once or twice, to the other's increasing annoyance, he paused standing still to watch the heights through the openings between the tumble-down old houses. Half a dozen big drops of rain splashed heavily on the road. "'Oh, hurry up!' cried Hendricks, looking back. "'Oh, we shall be caught! It's the mountain wind, the Coupe de Joran! You can hear it coming!' For the lad was peering across a low wall in an attitude of fixed attention. He made a gesture with one hand, as though he signalled towards the ridges where the fires blazed. Hendricks called pretty sharply to him then. It was possible, of course, that he misinterpreted the movement. It may merely have been that he passed his fingers through his hair, across his eyes, or used the palm to focus sight, for his hat was off and the light was quite uncertain. Only Hendricks did not like the lingering or the gesture. He put authority into his tone at once. Now come along, will you? Come along, Bindi, he called. The answer filled him with amazement. All right, all right, I'll follow in a moment. I like this. The tutor went back a few steps towards him. The tone startled him. Like what? he asked, and Lord Ernie turned towards him with another face. There was fighting in it. There was resolution. This, of course, the boy answered steadily, but with excitement shut down behind, as he waved one arm towards the mountains. 
I've dreamed of this sort of thing. I've known it somewhere. We've seen nothing like it on our, our stupid trip. The flash in his brown eyes passed then, as he added more quietly, but with firmness. Don't wait for me. I'll follow. Hendrik stood still in his tracks. There was a decision in the voice and manner that arrested him. The confidence, the positive statement, the eager desire, the hint of energy. All this was new. He had never encouraged the boy's habit of vivid dreaming, deeming the narration unwise. It flashed across him suddenly now that the deficiency might be only on the surface, energy and life hid, perhaps subconsciously, in him. Did the dreams betray an activity he knew not how to carry through and correlate with his everyday external world? And were these dreams evidence of deep, hidden desire? A clue, possibly, to the energy he sought and needed, the exact kind of energy that might set the inert machinery in motion and drive it? He hesitated an instant, waiting in the road. He was on the verge of understanding something that had yet evaded him. Bindi's childish, instinctive love of fire, his passion for air, for rushing wind, for oceans of limitless... There came at that moment a deep roaring in the mountains. Far away, but rapidly approaching, the ominous booming of it filled the air. The westerly wind descended by the deep gorges, shaking the forest, shouting as it came. Clouds of white dust spiralled into the sky off the upper roads, spread into sheets like snow, and swept downwards with incredible velocity. The air turned suddenly cooler. More big drops of rain splashed and thudded on the roofs and road. There was a feeling of something violent and instantaneous about to happen, a sense almost of attack. The Joran tore headlong down into the valley. "'Come on, man!' he cried at the top of his voice. "'That's the Joran! I know it of old! It's terrific! Run!' And he caught the lad, still lingering by the arm. But Lord Ernie shook himself free, with an excitement almost violent. "'I've been up there with those great fires,' he shouted. "'I know the whole blessed thing. But where was it? Where?' His face was white, eyes shining, manner strangely agitated. "'Big naked fellows who danced like wind, and rushing women of fire, and—' Two things happened then, interrupting the boy's wild language. The Joran reached the village and struck it. The houses shook, the trees bent double, and the cloud of limestone dust, painting the darkness white, swept on between Hendricks and the boy with extraordinary voice, even separating them. There was a clatter of falling tiles, of banging doors and windows, and then a burst of icy rain that fell like iron shot on everything, raising actual spray. The air was an instant thick. Everything drove past, roared, trembled. And, secondly, just in that brief instant when man and boy were separated, there shot between them, with shadowy swiftness, the figure of a man, hatless, with flying hair, who vanished with running strides into the darkness of the village street beyond. All so rapidly that sight could focus on manner neither of his coming nor of his going. Hendricks caught a glimpse of a swarthy, elemental type of face, the swing of great shoulders, the leap of big, loose limbs, something rushing and elastic in the whole appearance, but nothing he could claim for definite detail. The figure swept through the dust and wind like an animal, and was gone. 
it was indeed only the contrast of Lord Ernie's whitened skin, of his graceful, half-elegant outline, that enabled him to recall the details that he did. The weather-beaten visage seemed to storm away. Bindy's delicate, aristocratic face shone so pale and eager. But that a real man had passed was indubitable, for the boy made a flurried movement as though to follow. Hendricks caught his arm with a determined grip and pulled him back. "'Who was that? Who was it?' Lord Ernie cried breathlessly, resisting with all his strength, but vainly. "'Oh, some mountain fellow, of course, nothing to do with us.' and he dragged the boy back after him down the road. For a second both seemed to have lost their heads. Hendricks certainly felt a gust of something strike him into momentary consternation that was half alarm. "'From up there, where the fires are?' asked the boy, shouting above the wind and rain. "'Yes, yes, I suppose so. Come along!' We shall be soused. Are you mad? For Bindy still held back with all his weight, trying to turn round and see. Hendricks used more force. There was almost a scuffle in the road. All right, I'm coming. I only wanted a second look. You needn't drag my arm out. He ceased resistance, and they lurched forward together. But what a chap he was! He went like the wind! Did you see the light streaming out of him, like fire? Like what? shouted Hendricks, as they dashed now through the driving tempest. Fire! bawled the boy. It lit me up as he passed. Fire that lights that does not burn, and wind that blows the world along. "'Oh, button your coat up and run!' interrupted the other, hurrying his pace and pulling the lad forcibly after him. "'Don't twist! You're hurting! I can run as well as you!' came back with an energy Bindy had never shown before in his life. He was breathless, panting, charged with excitement still. "'It touched me as he passed!' fire that lights but doesn't burn and wind that blows the heart to flame let me go will you let go my hand he dashed free and away the torrential rain came down now in sheets from a windless sky for the joran was already miles beyond them tearing across the angry lake they reached the carpenter's house where the lodgings was soaked to the skin they dried themselves, and ate the light supper of soup and omelette prepared for them, ate it in their dressing-gowns. Lord Ernie went to bed with a hot water-bottle of rough stone. He declared with decision that he felt no chill. His excitement had somewhat passed. "'But I say, Mr. Hendricks,' he remarked, as he settled down with his novel and a cigarette, calmed and normal again. This is a place and a half, isn't it? Oh, it stirs me all up. I suppose it's the storm. What do you think? The electrical state of the air, yes, replied the tutor briefly. Soon afterwards he closed the shutters on the weather side, said good night, and went into his own room to unpack. The singular phrase Bindy had used kept singing through his head. Fire that lights but doesn't burn, and wind that blows the heart to flame. The first time he had said, blows the world along. Where on earth had the boy got hold of such queer words? He still saw the figure of that wild mountain fellow who had passed between them, with the dust and the wind and the rain. There was confusion in the picture, or rather in his memory of it, perhaps.
but it seemed to him, looking back now, that the man in passing had paused a second, the briefest second merely, and had spoken, or at any rate had stared closely a moment into Bindy's face, and that some communication had been between them in that moment of elemental violence. End of Part 2 Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick79 The Regeneration of Lord Ernie Part 3 Pastor Lazar, Hendricks remembered very well. Even now, in his old age, he was a vigorous personality. But in his youth he had been almost revolutionary. Wild enough, too, it was rumoured, until he had turned to God of his own accord as offering a larger field for his strenuous vitality. The little man was possessed of tireless life, a born leader of forlorn hopes, attack his metier, and heavy odds the conditions that he loved. Before settling down in his isolated spot, he had been a missionary in remote pagan lands. His horizon was a big one. He had seen strange things. An uncouth being, with a large head upon a thin and wiry body, supported by steely bowed legs, he had the courage which makes itself known in advance of any proof. Hendricks slipped over to Le Cure about nine o'clock, and found him in his study. Lord Ernie was asleep. At least his light was out. No sound or movement was audible from his room. The Joran had swept the heavens of clouds. Stars shone brilliantly. The fires still blazed faintly upon the heights. The visit was not unexpected, for Hendricks had already sent a message to announce himself, and the moment he sat down met the pastor's eye, heard his voice, and observed his slight imperious gestures, he passed under the influence of a personality stronger than his own. Something in Lazan's atmosphere stretched him, lifted his horizons. He had come chiefly, he now realized it, to borrow help and explanation with regard to Lord Ernie. The events of two hours before had impressed him more than he quite cared to own, and he wished to talk about it. But, somehow, he felt it difficult to state his case. No opening presented itself. Or rather, the pastor's mind, intent upon something of his own, was too preoccupied. In reply to a question presently, the tutor gave a brief outline of his present duties, but omitted the scene of excitement in the village street, for as he watched the furrowed frau in the light of the study lamp, he realized both anxiety and spiritual high pressure at work below the surface there. He hesitated to introduce his own affairs at first, they discussed nevertheless the psychology of the boy and the unfavourable chances of regeneration, while the old man's face lit up and flashed from time to time, until at length the truth came out, and Hendricks understood his friend's preoccupation. "'What you are attempting with an individual,' Lazan exclaimed with ardour, "'is precisely what I am attempting with a crowd.' and it's difficult for poor sinners make poor saints and the lukewarm i will spill out of my mouth he made an abrupt resentful gesture to signify his disgust and weariness perhaps his contempt as well cut it down 
why cumbereth it the ground well a hard uncharitable doctrine began the tutor realizing that he must discuss the parish before he could introduce bindy's case effectively you mean of course that there's no material to work on no energy to direct was the emphatic reply my sheep here are real sheep mere negative drinks sodden loafers without desire hospital cases i could work with tigers and wild beasts but who ever trained a slug your proper place is on the heights suggested hendricks interrupting at a venture there's scope enough up there or there used to be have they died out those wild men of the mountains and hit by chance the target in the bull's eye the old man's face turned younger as he answered quickly men like that he exclaimed do not die off they breed and multiply he leaned forward across the table his manner eager fervent almost impetuous with suppressed desire for action there's evil thinking up there he said suggestively but by heaven it's alive it's positive ambitious constructive with violent feeling and strong desire to work on there's hope of some result upon vehement impulses like that pagan or anything else a man can work with a will those are the tigers down here i have the slugs he shrugged his shoulders and leaned back into his chair hendricks watched him thinking of the stories told about his missionary days among savage and barbarian tribes what born of the vital landscape i suppose he asked wind and frost and blazing sun their wild energy i mean is due to a gesture from the old man stopped him you know who started them upon their wild performances he said gravely in a lower voice you know how that ambitious renegade priest from valley chose them from his nucleus then died before he could lead them out trained and competent upon his strange campaign you heard the story when you were with me as a boy i remember marston put in the other uncommonly interested marston the boy who he stopped because he hardly knew how to continue there was a minute's silence but it was not an empty silence though no word broke it Lazan's face was a study ah marston yes he said slowly without looking up you remember him but that is at my door too i suppose his father was ignorant and obstinate i might have saved him otherwise he seemed to be talking to himself rather than to his listener pain showed in the lines about his rugged mouth there was no one you see who knew how to direct the great life that woke up in the lad he took it back with him and turned it loose into a manner of useless enterprises and the doctors mistook his abrupt and fierce ambitions for for hysteria which they called the vestibule of lunacy yet small characters may have big ideas ah they didn't understand of course it was sad 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 he hid his face in his hands for a moment marston went wrong then in the end for the other's manner suggested distaste of some kind 
Hendricks asked it in a whisper. Lazan uncovered his face, looped his neck with one finger, and pointing to the ceiling. "'Hanged himself?' murmured Hendricks, shocked. The pastor nodded, but there was impatience, half anger in his tone. "'They checked it, kept it in. Of course, it tore him!' The two men looked into each other's eyes for a moment, and something in the younger of them shrank. This was all beyond his ken a little. An odd hint of bleak and cruel reality was in the air, making him shiver along nerves that were normally inactive. The uneasiness he felt about Lord Ernie became an alarm. His conscience pricked him. More than he could assimilate continued Lazan. It broke him. Yet, had outlets been provided, had he been taught how to use it, this elemental energy drawn direct from nature! He broke off abruptly, struck perhaps by the expression in his listener's eyes. It seems incredible, doesn't it? In the twentieth century, I know. Evil? asked Hendricks, stammering rather. Why evil? was the impatient reply. How can any force be evil? That's merely a question of direction. And the priest who discovered these forces and taught their use, then was genuinely spiritual, and followed the truth in his own way. He was not necessarily evil. The little pastor spoke with vehemence. You talk like the religion primers in the kindergarten, he went on. Listen, this man, sick and weary of his lukewarm flock, sought vital, stalwart systems who might be clean enough to use the elemental powers he had discovered how to attract. Only the bias of the users could make it evil by wrong use. His idea was big and even holy to train a corps that might regenerate the world, and he chose unreasoning, unintellectual types with a purpose. Primitive giant men who could assimilate the force without risk of being shattered. Under his direction he intended that he should prove as effective as the twelve disciples of old, who were fisher folk. And had he gone on? He too failed then, asked the other, whose tangled thoughts struggled with incredulity and belief as he heard the strange new thing. He died, you mean? Maison de Sainte, was the laconic reply. Straight waistcoats padded cells and the rest, but still alive, I'm told. It was more than he could manage. It was a startling story, even in this brief outline, deep suggestion in it. The tutor's sense of being out of his depth increased. After nine months with a lifeless, devitalized human being, this was well, he seemed to have fallen in his sleep from a comfortable bed into a raging mountain torrent. Strong currents rushed through and over him. The lonely, peaceful village outside, sleeping beneath the stars, heightened the contrast. Suppressed or misdirected energy again, I suppose, he said in a low tone respecting his companion's emotion. "'And these mountain men,' he asked abruptly, "'do they still keep up their practices?' "'Ah, their ceremonies, yes,' corrected the other, master of himself again. "'Turbulent moments of nature, 
storms and the like, stir them to clumsy rehearsals of once vital rituals. Not entirely ineffective, even in their incompleteness, but dangerous for that very reason. This Joran, for instance, invariably communicates something of its atmospherical energy to themselves. They light their fires as of old. They blunder through what they remember of his ceremonies. With their glasses you may see them in their dozens, men and women leaping and dancing. Oh, it's an amazing sight! Great beauty in it! Impossible to witness even from a distance without feeling the desire to take part in it. Even my people feel it. The only time they ever get alive. He jerked his big head contemptuously towards the street, or feel the desire to act. And someone from the heights, a messenger perhaps, will be down later, this very evening probably, on the hunt. On the hunt? Hendricks asked it half below his breath. He felt a touch of awe as he heard this experienced, generally religious man speak with conviction of such curious things. On the hunt, he repeated more eagerly. Ah, messengers do calm down, was the reply. A living belief always seeks to increase, to grow, to add to itself. Where there's conviction, there's always propaganda. Ah, converts? Lazan shrugged his big black shoulders. Desire to add to their number. Desire to save, he said. The energy they absorb overflows, that's all. The Englishman debated several questions vaguely in his mind. Only his mind, being disturbed, could not hold the balance exactly true. Lazan's influence, as of old, was upon him. A possibility, remote, seductive, dangerous, began to beckon to him, but from somewhere, just outside of his reasoning mind. And they always know when one of their kind is near, the voice slipped in between his tumbling thoughts, as though they get it instinctively from these universal elements they worship. They select their recruits with marvellous judgment and precision. No messenger ever gets back alone. Nor has a recruit ever been known to return to lazy squalor of the conditions which he escaped. The younger man sat upright in his chair, suddenly alert, and the gesture that he made unconsciously might have been read by a keen psychiatrist as evidence of mental self-defense. He felt the forbidden impulse in him gathering force and try to call a halt. At any rate, he called upon the other man to be explicit. He inquired, point-blank, what this religion of the heights might be. What were these elements these people worshipped? In what did their wild ceremonies consist? And Lazan, breaking bounds, let his speech burst forth in a stream of explanation, learned of actual knowledge, as he claimed, and uttered with a vehement conviction that produced an undeniable effect upon his astonished listener. Told by no dreamer, but by a righteous man who lived, not merely preached his certain faith, Hendricks, before the half was heard, forgot what age and land he dwelt in. 
whole blocks of conventional belief crumbled and fell away brick walls erected by routine to mark narrow paths to proper conduct safe moral advisable contact thawed and vanished through the ruins scrambling at him from huge horizons never recognized before came all manner of marvellous possibilities the little confinement of modern thought appalled him suddenly Lazan spoke slowly said little was not even speculative it was no mere magic of words that made the dim-lit study swim these deep waters beyond the ripple of pert creeds but rather the overwhelming sense of pure conviction driving behind the statements the little man had witnessed curious things yes in his missionary days and that he found truth in them in place of ignorant nonsense was remarkable enough that silly superstitions prevalent among older nations could be signs really of their former greatness linked mightily close to natural forces was a startling notion but it paved the way for hendrik's receptive mind just then for the belief that certain so-called elements might be worshipped known intimately that is to the uplifting advantage of the worshippers and what elements more suitable for adoring imitation than wind and fire for in a human body the first signs of what men term life are heat which is combustion and breath which is a measure of wind life means fire drawn first from the sun and breathing borrowed from the omnipresent air there might credibly be ways of assaulting these elements and taking heaven by storm of seizing from their inexhaustible stores an abnormal measure of straining this huge raw supply into effective energy for human use vitality living with fire and wind in their most active moments closely imitating their movements following in their footsteps understanding their laws of being going identically with them there lay a hint of the method it was once when men were primitively close to nature instinctual knowledge the ceremony was the teaching the powers of fire the principalities of air existed and humanity could know their qualities by the ritual of imitation could actually absorb the fierce enthusiasm of flame and the tireless energy of wind such transference was conceivable Lazan, at any rate somehow made it so his description of what he had personally witnessed both in wilder lands and here in this little mountain range of middle europe had a reality in it that was upsetting to the last degree there is nothing more difficult to believe he said yet more certainly true than the effect of these singular elemental rites <laughs> he laughed a short dry laugh the medieval superstition that a witch could rise a storm is but a remnant of a once completely efficacious system he concluded though how that strange being the valet priest rediscovered the process and introduced it here i have never been able to ascertain that he did so results have proved at any rate it lets in life life moreover in astonishing abundance though whether for destruction or regeneration depends obviously upon the use recipient puts it to that's where the direction comes in the beckoning impulse in the tutor's bewildered thoughts drew closer 
the moment for communicating it had come at last. Without more ado, he took the opening. He told his companion the incident in the village street, the boy's abrupt excitement, his new-found energy, the curious words he used, the independence and vitality of his attitude. He also told of his parentage, of his mother's disabilities, his craving for rushing air in abundance, his love of fire for its own sake, of his own magnificent physical machinery, yet of his uselessness. And Lazan, as he listened, seemed built on wires. Searching questions shot forth like blows into the other's mind. The pastor's sudden increase of enthusiasm was infectious. He leaped intuitively to the thing in Hendrik's thought. He understood the beckoning. The tutor answered the questions as best he could, aware of the end in view with trepidation and a kind of mental breathlessness. Yes, unquestionably, Bindy had exchanged communication of some sort with the man, though his excitement had been evident even sooner. "'And you saw this man yourself?' Lazan pressed him. Well, "'Indubitably, a tall and hurrying figure in the dusk. "'He brought energy with him. "'The boy felt it and responded. "'Hendricks nodded. "'Became quite unmanageable for some minutes,' he replied. "'He assimilated it, though. "'There was no distress, exactly.' Lazon asked sharply. Well, none that I could see. Pleasurable excitement, something aggressive, a rather wild enthusiasm. His will began to act. He used that curious phrase about wind and fire. He turned alive. He, he wanted to follow the man. And the face, how would you describe it? Did it bring terror, I mean, or, or confidence? Dark and splendid, answered the other as truthfully as he could. In a sense, rushing, tempestuous, yet stern rather. A face like the heights, suggested Lazan impatiently. A windy, fiery aspect in it, eh? Well, the man swept like the spirit of a storm in imaginative poetry, began the tutor, hunting through his thoughts for adequate description, then stopped as he saw that his companion had risen from his chair and had begun to pace the floor. The pastor paused a moment beside him, hands thrust deep into his pockets, head bent down and shoulders forward. For twenty seconds he stared into his visitor's face intently, as though he would force into him the thought of his own mind. His features seemed working visibly, yet behind a mask of strong control. "'Don't you see what it is?' "'Don't you see?' he said in a lower, deeper tone. "'They knew!' Even from a distance they were aware of his coming. He is one of themselves. And he straightened up again. He belongs to them. One of them? One of the wind and fire lot? The tutor stammered. The restless little man returned to his chair opposite full of suppressed and vigorous movement, as though he was strung on springs. He's of them, he continued, but in a peculiar and particular sense, more than merely a possible recruit. His empty organism would provide the very link they need, the perfect conduit. He watched his companion's face with careful keenness. In the country where I first experienced this marvellous thing, he added significantly, he would have been set apart as the offering, 
the sacrifice, as they call it there. The tribe would have chosen him with honor. He would have been the special bait to attract. Death, whispered the other. But Lazan shook his head. In the end, perhaps, he replied darkly, for the vessel might be torn and shattered. But at first, charged to the brim and crammed with energy, with transformed vitality, they could draw into themselves through him. A monster, if you will, but to them a deity, and superhuman in our little sense most certainly. Then Hendricks faltered inwardly and turned away. No words came to him at the moment. In silence the minds of the two men, one a religious, the other a secular teacher, and each with a burden of responsibility to the race, kept pace together without speech. The religious, however, outstripped the pedagogue. What he next said seemed a little disconnected with what had preceded it, although Hendricks caught the drift easily enough, and shuddered. An organism needing heat, observed Lazan calmly, can absorb without danger what would destroy a normal person. Alcohol, again, neither injures nor intoxicate, up to a given point, the system that really requires it. The tutor, perplexed and sorely tempted, felt that he had drifted with a tide he found difficult to stem. Oh, up to a point, he repeated. Well, that's true, of course. Up to a given point, echoed the other, with significance that made his voice sound solemn. Then rescue, in the nick of time. He waited two full minutes, and more for an answer. Then, as none was audible, he said another thing. His eyes were so intent upon the tutors that the latter raised his own unwillingly, and understood thus all that lay behind the pregnant little sentence. With a number it would not be possible, but with an individual it could be done. Brim the empty vessel first, then rescue, in the nick of time, regeneration. End of part three. Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick79. Story 1. The Regeneration of Lord Ernie by Algernon Blackwood. Part 4. In the Englishman's mind there came a crash, as though something fell. There was dust, confusion, noise. Moral platitudes shouted at conventional admonitions. Warnings laughed, and copybook maxims shriveled up. Above the lot, rising with a touch of grandeur, stood the pulpit figure of little Pasteur, his big face shining clear through the turmoil, strength and vision in the flaming eyes, a commanding outline with spiritual audacity in his heart and Hendrick saw then that the man himself was standing erect in the centre of the room, one finger raised to command attention, listening. Some considerable interval must have passed while he struggled with his inner confusion. Lazan stood, intently listening, his big head throwing a grotesque shadow on wall and ceiling. Ark! he exclaimed, half-whispering, "'Do you hear that? Listen!' A deep sound, 
confused and roaring, passed across the night, far away, and slightly booming. It entered the little room so that the air seemed to tremble a moment. To Hendricks it held something ominous. The wind, he whispered, as the noise died off in the distance. Yet a moment ago the night was still enough. The stars were shining. There was tense excitement in the room just then. It showed in Lazan's face, which had gone white as a cloth. Hendricks himself felt extraordinarily stirred. It's not wind, but human voices, the older man said quickly. It's shouting. Listen! And his eyes ran round the room, coming to rest finally in a corner where his hat and cloak hung from a nail. A gesture accommodated the look. He wanted to be out. The tutor himself rose to take his leave. You have duties tonight, elsewhere, he stammered. I'm forgetting. His own instinct was to get away himself with Bindi by the first early diligence. He was afraid of yielding. Hush! whispered Lazan peremptorily. Listen! He opened the window at the top, and through the crack, where the stars peeped brightly, there came, louder than before, the uproar of human voices floating through the night from far away. The air of the great pine forest came in with it. Hendricks listened intently for a moment. He positively jumped to feel a hand upon his arm. Lazan's big head was thrust close up into his face. "'That's the commotion of the village,' he whispered. "'A messenger has come and gone. Someone has gone back with him. "'Tonight I shall be needed. Down here, but tomorrow night, when the great ritual takes place, up there.' Hendricks tried to push him away, so as not to hear his words, but the little man seemed immovable as a rock. The impulse remained probably in the mind without making the muscles work, for the tutor, sorely tempted, longed to dare, yet faltered in his will. "'If you feel like taking a risk,' the words continued seductively, we might place the empty vessel near enough to let it fill, and then rescue it. Charge with energy, in the nick of time. And the pastor's eyes were aglow with enthusiasm, his voice even trembling at the thought of high adventure to save another's soul. Watch merely, Hendricks heard his own voice whisper, hardly aware that he was saying it, without taking part. He said it thickly, stupidly, a man wavering and unsure of himself. It would be an experience, he stammered. I I've never... Merely watch. Yes, look on. Let him see, interrupted the other with eagerness. We must be very careful. It's worth trying. Oh, a last resort. They stood still close together. Hendricks felt the little man's breath on his face as he peered up at him. I, I, I admit the chance, he began weakly. There is no chance was the vigorous reply. There is only providence. You have been guided. But as to risk and failure, what of them? What's involved? he asked, recklessness increasing in him. New wine in old bottles, was the answer. But here, you tell me, the vessel is not damaged, but merely empty. 
The machinery is all right if he merely watches, as from a little distance. Uh, yes, yes, the machinery is there. I agree. The, the boy has breeding, health, and all physical qualities. Good blood and nerves and muscles. It's only that life refused to stay and drive them. His heart beat with violence, even as he said it. He felt the energy and the zeal from the older man pour into him. He was realizing in himself, on a smaller scale, what might take place with the boy in large. But still he shrank. Lazan, for the moment, said no more. His spiritual discernment was equal to his boldness. Having planted the seed, he left it to grow or die. The decision was not for him. In the light of the single lamp, the two men sat facing each other, listening, waiting, while Lazan talked occasionally, but in the main kept silence. Some time passed, though how long the tutor could not say. In his mind was wild confusion. How could he justify such a mad proposal? Yet how could he refuse the opening, preposterous though it seemed? The enticement was very great. Temptation rushed upon him. Striving to recall his normal world, he found it difficult. The face of the old Marquis seemed a mere lifeless picture on a wall. It watched, but could not interfere. Here was an opportunity to take or leave. He fought the battle in terms of naked souls, while the ordinary four-cornered mortality hid its face a while. He heard himself explaining, delaying, hedging, half-toying with the problem. But the redemption of a soul was at stake, and he tried to forget the environment and conditions of modern thought and belief. Sentences flashed at him out of the battle. I must take him back, worse than when I started, or— What? A violent being like Marston, or a redeemed, converted system with new energy? It, it's, it's a chance, and my last. Moreover, odd, half-comic detail— there was the support of the church, of a Protestant clergyman whose fundamental beliefs were similar to the evangelical persuasions of the boy's family. Conversion, as demoniacal procession, were both traditions of the blood. After all, the old Marquis might understand and approve. Ah, you took the opening God set in your ways, in his wisdom. You showed faith and courage. Far be it from me to condemn you. The picture on the wall looked down at him and spoke the words. The wild hypothesis of the intrepid little missionary pastor swept him with an effect like hypnotism. Then suddenly... Something in him seemed to decide finally for itself. He flung himself, morality and all, upon the vigorous other personality. He leaned across the table, his face close to the lamp. His voice shook as he spoke. "'Would you?' he asked. Then knew the question foolish, and that such a man would shrink from nothing where the redemption of a soul was at stake knew also that the question was proof that his own decision was already made. There was something grotesque almost in the torrent of colloquial French laisan proceeded to pour forth, while the other sat listening in amazement, half ashamed and half exhilarated. He looked at the stalwart figure, the wiry bowed leg as he paced the floor, the shortness of the coat-sleeves, and the absence of shirt-cuffs round the powerful lean wrists. It was a great fighting man he watched, 
a man afraid of nothing in heaven or earth, prepared to lead a forlorn hope into the hostile unknown land. And the sight, combined with what he heard, set the seal upon his half-hearted decision. He would take the risk and go. "'A few!' exclaimed the little pastor, as though it might have been an oath, his loud whisper breaking through into a guttural sound. "'Few! Blah! Would that my people had machinery like that so I could use it! I've no material to work on, no force to direct, nothing but heavy, sodden clay! Jelly!' he cried. "'Negative, useless, lukewarm stuff at best!' He lowered his voice suddenly, so as to listen at the same time. "'I might as well be a baker, kneading dough,' he continued. "'They drink and yield and drink again. They never attack and drive. They're not worth labouring to save.' He struck the wooden table with his fist, making the lamp rattle, while his listener started and drew back. What good can weak souls, those spartless, be to God? The best have long ago gone up to them. And he jerked his leonine head towards the mountains. Where there's life, there's hope. He stamped his foot and he said it. But the lukewarm fia I will spew them out from my mouth. He paused by the window for a moment, listening attentively, then resumed his pacing to and fro. Clearly he longed for action. Indifference, half heartedness had no place in his composition, and Hendricks felt his own slower blood taking fire as he listened. Ah! cried Lezan louder. What a battle I could fight up there for God! Could I but live among them, stem the flow of their dark, strong virility, uh, then twist it round and up and up and up! And he jerked his finger towards skywards. It's the great sinners we want, not the meek faced saints. There's an energy enough among those devils to bring the whole canton to the great footstool. Could I but direct it? He paused a moment, standing over his astonished visitor. Bring the boy up with you, and let him drink his fill. And pray, pray, I say, that he become a violent sinner, first in order that later there shall be something worth offering to God. Over one sinner that repenteth! A rapid, nervous knocking interrupted the flow of words, and the figure of a woman stood upon the threshold. With the opening of the door came also again the roaring from the night outside. Hendrick saw the tall, somewhat dishevelled outline of the wife, he remembered her vaguely, though she could hardly see him now in his darker corner, and recalled the fact that she had been sent out to Lazan in his missionary days, a worthy, illiterate, but adoring woman. She wore a shawl, her hair was untidy, her eyes fixed and staring. Her husband's sturdy little figure, as he rose, stood level with her chin. I, you, you hear it, Jules, she whispered thickly. The Joran has brought them down. You will be needed in the village. She said it anxiously, though Hendricks understood the patois with difficulty. They talked excitedly together a moment in the doorway, their outlines blocked against the corridor, where a single oil lamp flickered. She warned, urging something, he expostulated. Fragments reached Hendricks in the corner. For clearly the woman worshipped her husband like a king, yet 
feared for his safety. He, for his part, comforted her, scolded a little, argued, told her to believe in God and go back to bed. Oh, they, they'll take you too, and you'll never return. It's not your parish anyhow. A touch of anguish in her tone. But Lazan was impatient to be off. He led her down the passage. My parish is wherever I can help. I belong to God. Nothing can harm me but to leave undone the work he gives me. The steps went farther away as he guided her to the stairs. Outside, the roar of voices rose and fell. Wind brought the drifting sound. Wind carried it away. It was like the thunder of the sea. And the Englishman, using the little scene as a flashlight upon his own attitude, saw it for an instant as God might have seen it. Lazan's point of view was high, scanning a very wide horizon. His eye being single, the whole body was full of light. The risk, it suddenly seemed, was nothing. To shirk it, indeed, the merest cowardice. He went and seized the pastor's hand. Tomorrow, he said, a trifle shakingly, perhaps, yet looking straight into his eyes, if we stay over, I'll bring the lad with me, providing he comes willingly. You will stay over, interrupted the other with decision. Come to supper at seven. Come in mountain boots. Use persuasion, but not force. He shall see it from a distance, without taking part. Oh, from a distance, yes, the tutor repeated, but without taking part. I know the signs, the pastor broke in significantly. We can rescue him in the nick of time, charged with the enemy of life. Yet before danger gets... A sudden clangor of bells drowned the whispering voice, cutting the sentence in the middle. It was like an, an alarm of fire. Lazan sprang sharply round. The signal, he cried, the signal from the church. Someone's been taken. I must go at once. I shall be needed. He had his hat and cloak on in a moment, was through the passage and into the street. Hendricks following at his heels. The whole place seemed alive, yet the roadway was deserted, and no light showed at the windows of the houses. Only from the farther end of the village, where stood the cabaret, came a roar of voices, shouting, crying, singing. The impression was that the population was centred there. Far in the starry sky a line of fires blazed upon the heights, throwing a lurid reflection upon the deep black valley. Excitement filled the night. But how extraordinary! claimed Hendricks, hurrying to overtake his alert companion. What life there is about! Everything's on the rush! They went faster, almost running. I feel the waves of it beating even here. He followed breathlessly. A messenger has come and gone, replied Lazan in a sharp, decided voice. What you feel here is but the overflow. This is the aftermath. I must work down here with my people. I I'll work with you began the other. But Lazan stopped him. Keep yourself for tomorrow night. Up there, he said with grave authority, pointing to the fiery line above the heights, and at the same time quickening his pace along the street. At the moment, he cried, looking back, your place is yonder. 
he jerked his head towards the carpenter's house among the vineyards, and the next minute he was gone. End of Part 4 Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick79 Part 5 The Regeneration of Lord Ernie And Hendricks, a credited tutor to a sprig of nobility in the twentieth century, asked himself suddenly how such things could possibly be. The adventure took on abruptly a touch of nightmare. Only the light in the sky above the cabaret windows, and the roar of the voices where men drank and sang, brought home the reality of it all. With a shudder of apprehension he glanced at the lurid glare of the mountains. He was committed now not because he had merely promised, but because he had definitely made up his mind. Lighting a match, he saw by his wristwatch that the visit had lasted over two hours. It was after eleven. He hurried, letting himself in with a big house-key, and going on tiptoe up the granite stairs. In his mind rose a picture of the boy as he had known him all these weary sight-seeing months. The mild, brown eyes, the facile indolence, the pliant, watery motions of the listless creature. But behind him now, like storm clouds, the hopes, desires, fears the pastor's talk had conjured up. The yearning to save stirred strongly in his heart, and more and more of the little man's reckless spiritual audacity came with it. His own affection for the lad was genuine, but impatience and adventure pushed eagerly through the tenderness. If only, oh, if only he could put life in that great six-foot big-bone frame, some energy as of fire and wind into that inert machinery of mind and body. The idea was utterly incredible. But surely no harm could come of trying the experiment. There were the huge and elemental forces, of course, in nature, and if— A sound in the bedroom, as he crept softly past the door, caught his attention, and he paused a moment to listen. Lord Ernie was not asleep then, after all. He wondered why the sound got somehow at his heart. There was shuffling behind the door. There was a voice, too. Or was it voices? He knocked. Who is it? Came at once in a tone he hardly recognized. And as he answered, It's I, Mr. Hendricks. Let me in. There followed a renewal of the shuffling, but without the sound of voices. And the door flew open. It was not even locked. Lord Ernie stood before him, dressed to go out. In the faint starlight the tall, ungainly figure filled the doorway, erect and huge, the shoulders squared, the trunk no longer drooping. The listlessness was gone. He stood upright, limbs straight and alert. The sagging limp had vanished from his knees. He looked in this semi-darkness like another person, almost monstrous. And the tutor drew back instinctively, catching an instant at his breath. "'But, my dear boy, why aren't you asleep?' he stammered. He glanced half-nervously about him. I, "'I heard you talking, surely?' He fumbled for a match. But before he found it, the other had turned on the electric switch. The light flared out. There was no one else in the room. I I is anything wrong with you? What's the matter? But the boy answered quietly, though in a deeper voice than Hendricks had ever known in him before. I'm all right. Only I couldn't sleep. I've been watching those fires on the mountains. I wanted to go out and see. 
He still held the field glasses in his hand, swinging them vigorously by the strap. The room was littered with clothes just unpacked, the heavy shooting boots in the middle of the floor. And Hendricks, noticing these signs, felt a wave of excitement sweep through him, caught somehow from the presence of the boy. There was a sense of vitality in the room, as though a rush of active movement had just passed through it. Both windows stood wide open, and the roar of voices was clearly audible. Lord Ernie turned his head to listen. Oh, that's only the village people drinking and shouting, said Hendricks, closely watching each movement that he made. Oh, it's perfectly natural, Bindy, that you feel too excited to sleep. Where in the mountains the air stimulates tremendously. It makes the heart beat faster. He decided not to press the lad with questions. But I never felt like this in the Rockies or the Himalayas, came the swift rejoinder as he moved to the window and looked out. There was nothing in India or Japan like that. He swept his hand towards the wooded heights that towered above the village so close. He talked volubly. All those things we saw out there were sham, done on purpose for tourists. Up there it's real. I've been watching through the glasses till I felt I simply must go out and join it. You can see men dancing round the fires and big rushing women. Oh, Mr. Hendricks, isn't it all glorious, all too glorious and ripping for words? And his brown eyes shone like lamps. Uh, you mean that it's spontaneous, natural? The other guided him, welcoming the new enthusiasm, yet still bewildered by the startling change. It was not mere nerves he saw. There was nothing morbid in it. They're doing it, I mean, because they have to, came the decided answer, and because they feel it. They're not just copying the world. He put his hands upon the other's arms. There was dry heat in it that Hendricks felt even through his clothes. And that's what I want, the boy went on, raising his voice. What I have always wanted, without knowing it. Real things that can make me alive. I've often had it in my dreams, you know. But now i found it. Uh, uh, but I didn't know. You never told me of those dreams. The boy's cheeks flushed, so that the colour and the fire in his eyes made him positively splendid. He answered slowly, as out of some party had hitherto deliberately concealed. Because I never could get hold of it in words. It sounded so silly, well, even to myself, and I thought father would train it all away and laugh at it. It's awfully far down in me, but it, it's so real. I knew it must come out one day, and that I, I should find it. Oh, I say, Mr. Hendricks, and he lowered his voice, leaning out across the windowsill suddenly, that fills me up and feeds me. He points to the heights, and gives me life. The life I've seen till now was only a kind of show. It starved me. I want to go up there and feed it pouring through my blood. He filled his lungs with a strong mountain air, and paused while he exhaled it slowly, as though tasting it with delight and understanding. Then he burst out again. I vote we go. Will you come with me? What do you say, eh? They stared at each other hard a moment. Something as primitive and irresistible as love passed through the air between them. With a great effort the older man kept the balance true. No, not tonight, not now, he said firmly. It's too late. Tomorrow, if you like with pleasure. But tomorrow night, cried the boy with a rush, when the fires are blazing and the wind is loose, not in the stupid daylight. 
All right, tomorrow night, and my old friend, Monsieur Lezan, shall be our guide. He knows the way, and he knows the people, too. Lord Ernie seized his hands with enthusiasm. His vigour was so disconcerting that it seemed to affect his physical appearance. The body grew almost visibly. His very clothes hung on him differently. He was no longer a non-entity, yawning beneath an ancient pedigree and title. He was an aggressive personality. The boy in him rushed into manhood, as it were, while still retaining boyish speech and gesture. It was uncanny. Oh, we'll go more than once, I vote. Go again and again. This is a place and a half. It's my place, with a vengeance. Oh, not exactly the kind of place your father would wish you to linger in, his tutor interrupted. But we might stay a day or two, especially as you like it so. It's far better than the towns and the rotten embassies, better than fifty Simlers and Bombays and, and filthy Cairos, cried the other eagerly. It's just the thing I need, and when I get home I'll show them something, I'll prove it, when they simply won't know me. He laughed, and his face shone with a kind of vivid radiance in the glare of the electric light. The transformation was more than curious. Waiting a moment to see if more would follow, Hendricks moved slowly then towards the door, with the remark that it was advisable now to go to bed, since they would be up late the following night. When he noticed for the first time that the pillow and sheets were crumpled, and that the bed had already been lain in, the first suspicion flashed back upon him with new certainty. Lord Ernie was already taking off his heavy coat, preparatory to undressing. He looked up quickly at the altered tone of voice. Bindi, the tutor said with a touch of gravity, you were alone just now, weren't you? Of course. The other sat up from stooping over his boots. With his hands resting on the bed behind him, he looked straight into his companion's eyes. Lying was not among his faults. He answered slowly, with a decided interval. I... I was asleep, he whispered, evidently trying to be accurate, yet hesitating how to describe the thing he had to say, and had a dream, one of my real vivid dreams, when something happens. Only this time it was more real than ever before. It was, he paused, searching for words, and then added, sweet and awful. And Hendricks repeated the surprising sentence, sweet and awful, Bindi, what in the world do you mean, boy? Lord Ernie seemed puzzled himself by the choice of words he used. I, I don't know exactly, he went on honestly, only I mean that it was awfully real and splendid, a bit of my own life somewhere, somewhere else, where it lies hidden away behind a lot of days and months that choke it up. I can never get at it except in woods and places, quite alone, hearing the wind or making fires or in sleep. He hid his face in his hands a moment then looked up with a hint of censure in his eyes. Why didn't you tell me that such things were done? You never told me, he repeated. Well, I didn't know it myself until this evening. Lazan, I thought you knew everything. Lord Ernie broke in, in that same half-chiding tone. Well, Monsieur Lazan told me tonight for the first time said Hendricks firmly, that such people and such practices as existed. Till now I had never dreamed that such superstitions survived anywhere in the world at all. He resented the reproach, but he was also aware that the boy resented his authority. 
For the first time his ascendancy seemed in question. His voice, his eye, his manner did not quell as formerly. So you mean, when you say, sweet and awful, that it was very real to you? he asked. He insisted now with purpose. Is that it, Bindi? The other replied eagerly enough. Yes, that's it. I think, well, partly, this time it was more than dreaming. Well, it was real. I got there. I remembered. That's what I meant. And after I woke up, the thing still went on. The man seemed still in the room beside the bed, calling me to get up and go with him. Man? What man? The tutor leant upon the back of the chair to steady himself. The wind just then went past the open windows with a sighing rush. The dark man who passed us in the village, and who pointed to the fires on the height. He came with the wind, you remember. He pulled my coat. The boy stood up as he said it. He came across the naked boring, his step light and dancing. Fire that heats that does not burn, and wind that blows the heart alight, or something. I forget now exactly. You heard it too. He whispered the words with excitement, raising his arms and knees as in the opening movements of a dance. Hendricks kept his own excitement down, but with a distinctly conscious effort. I heard nothing of the kind, he said calmly. I was only thinking of getting home dry. You say, he asked with a decision, that you heard those words. Lord Ernie stood back a little. It was not that he wished to conceal, but that he felt uncertain how to express himself. In the street, he said, I heard nothing. The words rose up in my own head, as it were. But in the dream, and afterwards too, when I was wide awake, I heard them out aloud, clearly. Fire that heats but does not burn, and wind that blows the heart to flame. That's how it was. In French, Bindi, you heard it in French. Oh, it was no language at all. The eyes said it. Both times. He spoke as naturally as though it was the Derber he described again. Only this new, aggressive certainty was in his voice and manner. Mr. Hendricks he went on eagerly. You understand what I mean, don't you? When certain people look at one, words start up in the mind as though one heard them spoken. I heard the words in my head, I suppose. Only they seem so familiar, as though I had known them before. Always. Of course, Bindi, I understand. But this man, tell me, did he stay on after you woke up? And how did he go? He looked round at the barely furnished room for hiding places. It was really the dream you carried on after waking, wasn't it? Then Bindi laughed, but inwardly, as to himself. There was the finest possible hint of derision in his voice. No doubt he said. Only it was one of my big, real dreams. And how he went, well, I can't explain at all, for I didn't see. You knocked on the door. I turned and found myself standing in the room, dressed to go out. There was a rush of wind outside the window, and when I looked, he, he was no longer there. The same minute you came in. Well, it was as all as quick as that. I suppose I dressed in my sleep. They stood for several minutes, staring at each other without speaking. The tutor hesitated between several courses of action, unable for the life of him to decide upon any particular one. 
His instinct on the whole was to stop nothing but to encourage all possible expression, while keeping rigorous watch and guard. Repression, it seemed to him just then, was the least desirable line to take. Somewhere there was truth in the affair. He felt out of his depth, his authority impaired, and under these temporary disadvantages he might so easily make a grave mistake, injuring instead of helping. While Lord Ernie finished his undressing, he leaned out of the window, taking great draughts of the keen night air, watching the blazing fires, and listening to the roar of voices, now dying down into the distance. and the voice of his thinking whispered to him, Let it all come out. Repress nothing. Let him have the entire adventure. If it's nonsense it can't injure, and if it's true it's inevitable. He drew his head in and moved towards the door. Then it's settled, he said quietly, as though nothing unusual had happened. We'll go up there tomorrow night with Monsieur Lezan, to show us the way. And you'll go to sleep now, won't you? For tomorrow we may be up very late. Promise me, Bindi? Oh, I'm dead tired, came the answer from the sheets. I certainly shan't dream any more, if that's what you mean. <laughs> I promise. Hendricks turned the light out and went softly from the room. He could always trust the boy. "'Good night, Bindi,' he said. "'Good night,' came the drowsy reply. Upstairs he lingered a long time over his own undressing, listening, waiting, watching for the least sound below. But nothing happened. Once, for his own peace of mind, he stole stealthily downstairs to the boy's door. Then, reassured by the heavy breathing that was distinctly audible, he went up finally and got into bed himself. The night was very still now. It was cool, and the stars were brilliant over lake and forest and mountain. No voices broke the silence. He only heard the tinkle of the little streams beyond the vineyards, and by midnight he was sound asleep. End of Part 5《Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick seventy nine. Part six. And next day broke as soft and brilliant as though October had stolen it from June. The Alps gleamed through an almost summery haze across the lake. The air held no hint of coming winter and the Jura Mountains wore the true blue of memory in Hendricks's mind. Patches of red and yellow splashed the great pine woods here and there, where beech and ash put autumn in the vast dark carpet. The tutor woke clear-headed and refreshed. All that had happened the night before seemed out of proportion and unreasonable. There had been exaggerated emotion in it, in himself, because he returned to a place still charged with potent memories of youth, and in Lord Ernie, because the lad was overwrought by the electrical disturbance of the atmosphere. The nearness of the ancestral halls which they both disliked had emphasized it. The ominous wild weather had favored it, and the coincidence of these pagan rites of superstitious peasants had focused it all into a melodramatic form with an added touch of the supernatural that was highly picturesque and, well, dangerously suggestive. Hendricks recovered his common sense. Judgment asserted itself again. Yet, 
For all that, certain things remained authentic. The effect upon the boy was not illusion, nor his words about fire and wind mere meaningless invention. There hid some undivined and significant correspondence between the gaps in his deficient nature and these two turbulent elements. The talk with Lazan, as the conduct of his wife, remained authentic. Those facts were too steady to be dismissed, the pastor too genuinely in earnest to be catalogued in dream. Neither daylight nor common sense could dissipate their actuality. Truth lay somewhere in it all. Thus the day for the tutor was a battle that shifted with varying fortune between doubt and certainty. In the morning his mind was decided. The wild experiment was unjustifiable. In the afternoon, as the sunshine grew faint and melancholy, it became interesting for what harm could come of it. But towards evening, when shadows lengthened across the purple forests and the trees stood motionless in the calm and windless air, the adventure seemed, as it had seemed the night before, not only justifiable, but right and necessary. It only became inevitable, however, when after tea together on the balcony, Lord Ernie, mentioning the subject for the first time that day, asked pointedly what time the pastor expected them to supper. Then, noticing the flash of hesitancy in his companion's eyes, added in his strange deep voice, You promised we should go. Withdrawal after that was out of the question. To retract would have meant, for one thing, final loss of the boy's confidence, a possibility not to be contemplated for a moment. Until this moment no word of the preceding night had passed the lips of either. Lord Ernie had been quiet and preoccupied, silent rather, but never listless. He was peaceful, perhaps subdued a little, yet with a suppressed energy in his bearing that Hendricks watched with secret satisfaction. The tutor, closely observant, detected nothing out of gear. Life stirred strongly in him. There was purpose, interest, will. There was desire, but there was nothing to cause alarm. Availing himself then of the lad's absorption in his own affairs, he wandered forth alone upon his sentimental tour of inspection. No ghost of emotion rose to stalk beside him. That early tragedy, he now saw clearly, had been no more than youthful explosion of mere physical passion, wholesome and natural, but due chiefly to propinquity. His thoughts ran idly on, and he was even congratulating himself upon escape and freedom when, abruptly, he remembered a phrase Bindi had used the night before, and stumbled suddenly upon a clue when least expecting it. He came to a sudden halt. The significance of it crashed through his mind and startled him. There are big women! It was the first reference to the other sex, as evidence of their attraction for him, Hendricks had ever known to pass his lips. Hitherto, though twenty years of age, the lad had never spoken of women as though he was aware of their terrible magic. He had not discovered them as females, necessary to every healthy male. It was not purity, of course, but ignorance. He had felt nothing. Something had now awakened sex in him, so that he knew himself a man and naked. And it had revolutionized the world for him. This new life came from the roots, transforming listless indifference into positive desire. The will woke out of sleep, and all the torrents of his system took aggressive form for all energy, intellectual, emotional or spiritual, is fundamentally one. It is primarily sexual. 
Hendricks paused in his sentimental walk, marvelling that he had not realised sooner this simple truth. It brought a certain logical meaning even into the pagan rites upon the mountains, these ancient rites which symbolised the marriage of the two tremendous elements of wind and fire, heat and air. And the lad's quiet, busy mood that morning confirmed his simple discovery. It involved restraint and purpose. Lord Ernie was alive. Hendricks would take home with him to those ancestral halls a vessel bursting with energy, creative energy. It was admirable that he should witness, from a safe distance, this primitive ceremony of crude pagan origin. It was the very thing. And the tutor hurried back to the house among the vineyards, aware that his responsibility had increased, but persuaded more than ever that his course was justified. The sky held calm and cloudless through the day, the forest brooding beneath the hazy autumn sunshine. Indications that the second hurricane lay brewing among the heights were not wanting, however, to experienced eyes. Almost a preternatural silence reigned. There was a warm heaviness in the placid atmosphere. The surface of the lake was patched and streaky, the extreme clarity of the air an ominous omen. Distant objects were too close. Towards sunset, moreover, the streaks and patches vanished as though sucked below, while thin strips of tenuous cloud appeared from nowhere above the northern cliffs. They moved with great rapidity at the enormous height, touched with a lurid brilliance as the sun sank out of sight. And when Hendricks strolled over with Lord Ernie to La Cure for supper, there came a sudden rush of heated wind that set the branches sharply rattling, then died away as abruptly as it rose. They seemed reflected, too, these disturbances, in the human atmospheres about the supper-table. There was suppression of various emotions, emotions presaging violence. Lord Ernie was exhilarated, Hendricks uneasy and preoccupied, the pastor grave and thoughtful. In Hendricks was another feeling as well, that he had lightly summoned a storm which might carry him off his feet. The boy's excitement increased it, as wind-puffs fan a starting fire. His own judgment had somewhere played him false, betraying into this incredible adventure and yet he could not stop it. The pastor's influence was over him, perhaps. He was ashamed to turn back. He was committed. The unusual circumstances found the weakness in his character. For somewhere in the preposterous supposition there lay a big forgotten truth. He could not believe it, and yet he did believe it. The world had forgotten how to live truly close to nature. A desultory conversation was carried on, chiefly between the two men, while the boy ate hungrily, and Madame Lezanne watched her husband with anxiety as she served the simple meal. "'So you are coming with us, and you like to come?' the pastor observed quietly, Hendricks translating. Lord Ernie replied with a gesture of unmistakable enthusiasm. "'A wild lot of men and women,' Lazan went on, keeping his eye hard upon him, "'with an interesting worship of their own, copied from very ancient times. They live on the heights, and mix little with us valley folk. You shall see their ceremonies to-night.' "'They get the wind and fire into themselves, don't they?' asked the boy keenly, and somewhat to the distress of the translator who rendered it, "'They get into wind and fire.' "'Ah, they worship wind and fire,' Lazan replied, 
and they do it by means of a wonderful dance that somehow imitates the leap of flame and a headlong rush of wind. If you copy the movements and gestures of a person, you discover the emotion that causes them. You share it. Their idea is, apparently, that by imitating the movements, they invite or attract the force. Draw these elemental powers into their systems, so that in the end... He stopped suddenly, catching the tutor's eye. Lord Ernie seemed to understand without translation. He had laid down his knife and fork, and was leaning forward across the table, listening with deep absorption. His expression was alert with a new intelligence that was almost cunning. An acute sensibility seemed to have awakened in him. "'As with laughing, I suppose,' he said in an undertone to Hendricks quickly. "'If you imitate laughter, you laugh yourself in the end "'and feel all the jolly excitement of laughter. "'Is that what he means?' "'The tutor nodded with assumed indifference. "'Imitation is always infectious,' he said lightly. "'But, of course, you will not imitate these wild people yourself, Bindi.' We will just look on from a distance. From a distance? repeated the boy, obviously disappointed. What's the good of that? A look of obstinacy passed across his altered face. Hendricks met his eyes squarely. At a circus, he said firmly, you just watch. You don't imitate the clown, do you? If you look long enough, you do was the rather dogged reply. "'Well, take the Russian dancers we saw in Moscow,' the other insisted patiently. "'You felt the power and beauty without jumping up and whirling in your stall?' Bindi half glared at him. There was almost contempt in his quiet answer. "'But your mind whirled with them, and later your body would too. Otherwise he's given you nothing.' He paused a second. I can only get fun of riding by being on a horseback and doing his movements exactly with him, not by watching him. Hendrick smiled and shrugged his shoulders. He did not wish to discourage the enthusiasm lying behind this analysis. The uneasiness in him grew apace. He said something rapidly in French, using an undertone and laughter to confuse the actual words. "'Of course we must not interfere with their ceremonies,' put in the pastor with decision. "'It's sacred to them. We can hide among the trees and watch. "'You would not leave your seat in church to imitate the priest, now would you?' "'He glanced smilingly at the eager youth before him. "'If he did something real, I would,' it was said with a bright flash in his eyes. Anything real, I'd copy like a shot, only I never find it. The reply was disconcerting, rather, and Hendricks, as he hurriedly translated, made a clatter with a knife and fork, for something in him rose to meet the truth behind the curious words. From that moment, as though catching a little of the boy's exhilaration, he passed under a kind of spell, perhaps. It was in spite of the exaggeration, oddly stimulating. This dull little meal at the village cure masked an accumulating vehemence, eager to break loose. He heard the old father's voice. Ah, well done, Hendricks. You have accomplished wonders. He would take back the boy alive. Yet all the time there were streaks and patches on his soul, as upon the surface of the lake that afternoon. There were signs of terror. He felt himself letting go, an increasing recklessness, a yielding up more and more of his own authority to that of this triumphant boy. Bindi understood the meaning of it all, and felt secure. Hendricks faltered, hesitated, stood on the defensive. Yet ever less and less, already he accepted the other's guidance. 
Already Lord Ernie's leadership was in the ascendant. Conviction invariably holds dominion over doubt. They ate little. It was near the end of the meal when the wind, falling from a clear and starlit sky, struck its first violent blow, dropping with the force of an explosion that shook the wooden house, and passing with a roar towards the distant lake. The oil lamp, suspended from the ceiling, trembled. The pastor looked apprehensively at the shuttered windows, and Lord Ernie, with startling abruptness, stood up. His eyes were shining, his voice was brisk, alert, and deep. "'The wind! The wind!' he cried. "'Think what will be up there! We shall feel it on our bodies!' His enthusiasm was like a rush of air across the table. "'And the fire!' he went on. "'The flames will lick all over and tear about the sky. I feel the wild and full of them already. How splendid!' and the flame of the little lamp leaped higher in the chimney, as he said it. "'The violence of the coup de Joran is extraordinary,' explained Leitan, as he got up to turn down the wick. "'And the second outburst—' The rest of the sentence was drowned by the noise of Hendrix's voice, telling the boy to sit down and finish his supper. And at the same moment the pastor's wife came in, as though a stroke of wind drove behind her down the passage. The door slammed in the draught. There was a momentary confusion in the room, above which her voice rose shrill and frightened. Oh, the, the fires are alight, Jules, she whispered in her half-intelligible patois. Oh, the, the forest is burning all along the upper ridge. Her face was pale and her speech was stumbling. She lowered her lips to her husband's ear. Ah, they'll be looking out for recruits tonight. Is it necessary? Is it right for you to go? She glanced uneasily at the English visitors. You know the danger. He stopped her with a gesture. Those who look on at life accomplish nothing, he answered impatiently. One must act, always act. Chances are sent to be taken not stared at. He rose, pushing past her into the passage, and as he did so she gave him one swift comprehensive look of tenderness and admiration, then hurried after him to find his hat and cloak. Willingly she would have kept him at home that night, yet gladly, in another sense, she saw him go. She fumbled in her movements, ready to laugh or cry or pray. Hendrick saw her pain and understood. It was singular how the woman's attitude intensified his own misgivings. Her behaviour, the mere expression of her face alone, made the adventure so absolutely real. Three minutes later they were in the village street. Hendricks and Lord Ernie, the latter impatient in the road beyond, saw her tall figure stoop to embrace him. I shall pray all night. I shall watch from my window for your return. God who speaks from the whirlwind and whose pathway is the fire will go with you. Remember the younger men. It is ever the younger men that they seek to take. Her words were half hysterical. The kiss was given and taken. The open doorway framed her outline a moment. Then the buttress of the church blotted her out, and they were off. End of Part 6《Incredible Adventures》by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick79. Story 1. The Regeneration of Lord Ernie. Part 7. And at once the curious confusion of strong wind was upon them. Gusts howled about the corners of the shuttered houses, 
and tore noiselessly across the open yards. Dust whirled with a rapidity as of some spectral white machinery. A tile came clattering down about their feet, while overhead the roofs had an air of shifting, toppling, bending. The entire village seemed scooped up and shaken, then dropped upon the earth again in tottering fashion. "'This way!' gasped the little pastor, blown sideways like a sail. "'Follow me closely!' Almost arm in arm at first they hurried down the deserted street, past lampless windows and tight-fastened doors, and soon they were beyond the cabaret in that open stretch between the village and the forest where the wind had unobstructed way. Far above them ran the fiery mountain edge. They saw the glare reflected in the sky as the tempest first swept them all three together, then separated them in the same moment. They seemed to spin or whirl. "'It's far worse than I expected,' shouted their guide. "'Here, give me your hand!' Then found, once disentangled from his flapping coat, that no one stood beside him. For each of them it was a single fight to reach the shelter of the woods, where the actual ascent began. An instant the pastor seemed to hesitate. He glanced back at the lighted windows of La Cure across the fields, at the line of fire in the sky, at the figure disappearing in the blackness immediate ahead. "'Where's the boy?' he shouted. "'Don't let him get too far in front. Keep close. Wait, wait till I come.' They staggered back against each other. "'Look how easily he slipped ahead already!' Uh, "'This howling wind!' Hendricks shouted, as they advanced side by side, pushing their shoulders against the storm. The rest of the sentence vanished into space. Lazan shoved him forward, pointing to where, some twenty yards in front, the figure of Lord Ernie, head down, was battling eagerly with the hurricane. Already he stood near the shelter of the trees, waving his arms with energy towards the summits where the fire blazed. He was calling something at the top of his voice, urging them to hurry. His voice rushed down upon them with a pelt of wind. "'Don't let him get away from us!' bawled Lazan holding his hands cupwise to his mouth. "'Keep him in reach! He may see, but must not take part!' A blow full in the face that smote him like the flat of a great sword clapped the sentence short. "'That's your part! He won't obey me!' Hendricks heard it as they plunged across the wind-swept reach, panting, struggling, forcing their bodies sideways like two-legged crabs against the terrific force of the descending Juran. They reached the protection of the forest wall without further attempt at speech. Here there was a sudden peace and silent, for the tall, dense trees received the tempest impact like a cushion, stopping it. They paused a moment to recover breath. But although the first exhaustion speedily passed, that original confusion of strong wind remained, in Hendrick's mind at least, for wind violent enough to be battled with has a scarring effect on thoughts and blows the very blood about. Something in him snapped its cables and blew out to sea. His breath drew in an impetuous quality from the tempest each time he filled his lungs. There was agitation in him that caused an odd exaggeration of the emotions. The boy, as they came up, leaped down from the boulder he had climbed. He opened his arms, making of his cloak a kind of sail that filled and flapped. "'At last!' he cried, impatient, almost vexed. "'I thought you were never coming. The wind blew me along.' We shall be late. The tutor caught his arm with vigour. 
Now you keep by us, Ernest. Do you hear now? No rushing ahead like that. Lay's hands the guide, not you. He even shook him, but as he did so he was aware that he himself resisted something that he did not really want to resist, something that urged him forcibly. A little more he would yield to it with pleasure, with abandon, finally with recklessness. A reaction of panic fear ran over him. It, it was the wind, I tell you, cried the boy, flinging himself free with a hint of insolence in his voice. For it's alive! I mean to see everything. The wind's our leader, and the fire's our guide. He made a movement to start on again. "'You'll obey me!' thundered Hendricks. "'Or else you go home. Do you understand?' With exasperation, yet with uneasy delight, he noted the words Bindy made use of. It was in him that he might also have uttered them himself. He stepped already into an entirely new world. Exhilaration caught him even now, putting the brake on was mere pretense. He seized the lad by both shoulders and pushed him to the rear, then placed himself next, so that Lazan moved in front and led the way. The procession started, diving into the comparative shelter of the forest. "'Don't let him pass you!' he heard in rapid French. "'Guide him! That's all! The power's already in his blood!' Keep yourself in hand as well, and follow me closely. The roar of the storm above them carried the words clean off the world. Here in the forest they moved, it seemed, along the floor of an ocean whose surface raged with dreadful violence. Any moment one or other of them might be caught up at that surface and whirled off to destruction for the procession was not one of itself. The darkness, the difficulty of hearing what each said, the feeling, too, that each climbed for himself, made everything seem at sixes and sevens. And the tutor, this secret exultation growing in his heart, denied the anxiety that kept its pace, and battled with its turbulent emotions, a divided personality. His power over the boy, he realized, had gravely weakened. A little time ago they had seemed somehow equal. Now, however, a complete reversal of their relative positions had taken place. The boy was sure of himself. While Lazon led at a steady mountaineer's pace on his wiry, short, bowed legs, Hendricks, a yard or two behind him, stumbled a good deal in the darkness. Lord Ernie forever on his heels, eager to push past. But Bindy never stumbled. There was no flagging in his muscles. He moved so lightly and with so sure a tread that he almost seemed to dance, and often he stopped aside to leap a boulder or to run along a fallen trunk path there was none. Occasional gusts of winds rushed gustily down into these depths of forest where they moved, and now, from time to time, as they rose nearer to the line of fire on the ridge, an increasing glare lit up the knuckled roots, or glimmered on the bramble thickets and heavy beds of moss. It was astonishing how the little pastor never missed his way. Periods of thick silence alternated with moments, when the storm swept down through the gullies, among the trees, reverberating like thunder in the hollows. Slowly they advanced, buffeted, driven, pushed, the wildness of some wild purgeous night growing upon all three. In the tutor's mind was this strange lift of increasing recklessness. The old proportion was gone, the spiritual aspect of it troubling him to the point of sheer distress. He followed Lazan as blindly with his body as he followed this new Bindi, eagerly with his mind. 
for this languid boy, now dancing to the tune of flooding life at his very heels, seemed magical in the true sense, energy created by a wizard out of nothing. From lips that ordinarily sighed in listless boredom poured now a ceaseless stream of questions and ejaculations ringing with enthusiasm. How long would it take to reach the fiery ridge? Why did they go so slowly? Would they arrive too late? Would their intrusion be welcomed or understood? Already one great change was effected, accepted by Hendricks too, that the role of mere spectator was impossible. The answers Hendricks gave, indeed, grew more and more encouraging and sympathetic. He, too, was impatient of their leader's crawling pace. Some elemental spell of wind and fire urged him towards the open ridge. The pull became irresistible. He despised the pastor's caution, denied his wisdom, wholly rejected now the spirit of compromise and prudence. And once, as the hurricane brought down a flying burst of voices, he caught himself leaping upon a big grey boulder in their path. He leaped at the very moment that the boy behind him leaped, yet hardly realised that he did so. His feet danced without a conscious order from his brain. They met together on the rounded top, stumbled, clutched one another frantically, then slid with waving arms and flying cloaks down the slippery surface of damp moss, laughing wildly. "'You fool!' cried Henrik, saving himself. "'What in the world?' "'You cold!' laughed Bindy, picking himself up and dropping back to his place in the rear again. "'It's the wind! It's not me! It's in our feet! Half the time you're shouting and jumping yourself!' And it was a few minutes after this that Lord Ernie suddenly forged ahead. He slipped in front as silently as a shadow before a moving candle in a room, passing the tutor, at a moment when his feet were entangled among roots and stones. He easily overtook the pastor and found himself in the lead. He never stumbled. There seemed steel springs in his legs. From Lazan, too breathless to interfere, came a cry of warning. "'Stop him! Take his hand!' His tired voice instantly smothered by the roaring skies. He turned to catch Hendricks by the cloak. "'You see that?' he shouted in alarm. "'For the love of God, don't lose sight of him! He must see, but not take part! Remember!' and Hendricks yelled after the vanishing figure, "'Bindy, go slow! Go slow! Keep in touch with us!' But he quickened his pace instantly, as though to overtake the boy. He passed his companion the same minute and was out of sight. "'I'll wait for you!' came back the boy's shrill answer through the thinning trees and a flare of light fell with it from the sky, for the final climb of the steep five hundred feet had now begun, and overhead the naked ridge ran east and west with its line of blazing fires. Boulders and rocky ground replaced the pines and spruces. "'But you'll never find the way!' shouted Lazan while a deep trumpeting roar of the storm beyond muffled the remainder of the sentence. Hendricks heard the next words close beside him from a clump of shadows. He was in touching distance of the excited boy. "'The fires and the singing guide me! Only a fool could miss the way! But you are a—' He swallowed the unuttered word. A new, extraordinary respect was suddenly in him. That tall, virile figure, instinct with life, 
springing so cleverly through the choking darkness, guiding with decision and intelligence, almost infallible. It was no fool that led them thus. He hurried after till his very sinews ached, his eyes troubled and confused, strained through the trees to find him. But these same trees now fled past him in a torrent. "'Bindy! Bindy!' he cried at the top of his voice. Yet not with the imperious tone the situation called for. The sentence dropped into a lull of wind. Instead of command there was entreaty, almost supplication in it. "'Wait for me! I'm coming! We, we'll see the glorious thing together!' And then suddenly the forest lay behind him, with a belt of open pasture-land in front, below the actual ridge. He felt the first great draught of heat, as a line of furnaces burst their doors with a mighty roar, and turned the sky into a blaze of golden daylight. There was a crackling as of musketry. The flare shot up and burned the air about him, and the voices of a multitude, as yet invisible, drove through it like projectiles of the wind. This was the first impression, wholesale and terrific, that met him as he paused an instant on the edge of the sheltering forest and looked forward. Lazan and Lord Ernie seemed to leave his mind, forgotten in this first attack of splendour, but forgotten, as it were, the first with contempt the latter with an overwhelming regret. For the pastor's mistake in that instant seemed obvious. In half measures lay the fatal error, and in compromise the danger. Bindy all along had known the better way and followed it. The lukewarm was the worthless. "'Bindy, boy, where are you? I'm coming!' and stepping on to the grassy strip of ground, soft to his feet, he met a wind that fell upon his body with a shower of blows from all directions at once, and beat him to his knees. He dropped, it seemed, into the cover of a sheltering rock, for there followed then a moment of sudden and delicious stillness in which the weary muscles recovered themselves, and thought grew slightly steadier. Crouched thus, Close to the earth he no longer offered a target to the hurricane's attack. He peered upward, making a screen of his hands. The ridge, some fifty feet above him, he saw, ran in a generous platform along the mountain crest. It was wide and flat. Between the enormous fires of piled-up wood that stretched for half a mile coiled a medley of dense smoke and tearing sparks. No human beings were visible, and yet he was aware of crowding life quite near. On hands and knees, crawling painfully, he then slowly retreated again into the shelter of the forest he had sought to leave. He stood up. The awful blaze was veiled by the roof of branches once more. But, as he rose, seizing a sapling to steady himself by, two hands caught him with violence from behind, and a familiar voice came shouting against his ear. Lazan, panting, dishevelled, and half-broken with speed, stood beside him. <laughs> the boy! Where is he? We're, we're just in time! He roared the words to make them carry above the din. Hurry! Hurry! I'll follow! Oh, oh, my old legs! See, for the love of God that he is not taken! Now I have warned you! And for a second, as he heard, Hendrik is caught at the vanished sense of responsibility again. He saw the face of the old Marquis watching him among the trees. He heard his voice, amazed, reproachful, furious. It was criminal of you, criminal! 
"'Where is the boy? Your boy!' again broke in the shout of the pastor with a slap of hurricane. As he staggered against the tutor, half collapsing, and trying to point the direction, "'Watch him! Find him! For the love of heaven! Before it is too late! Before they see him!' The tutor's normal, responsible self dived out of sight again as he heard the cry of weakness and alarm. It seemed the wind got under him, lifting him bodily from his feet. He did not pause to think. Like a man midway in a whirling prize-fight, he felt dazed but confident, only conscious of one thing, that he must hold out to the end, take part in all the splendid fighting, win! The lust of the arena, the pride of youth and battle, the impetuous recklessness of the charge in primitive war, caught at his heart, brimming it with headlong courage. To play the game for all it might be worth seemed shouted everywhere about him, as the abandon of wind and fire rushed through him like a storm. He felt lifted above all possibility of little failure. The Marquis, with his conventional traditions, the pastor with his considerations of half-way safety, both vanished utterly. Safety, indeed, both for himself and for the boy in his charge lay in unconditional surrender. This was no time for little thought-out actions. It was all or nothing. God bless the whirlwind and the fire, he shouted, opening wide his arms. But his voice was inaudible amid the uproar, and the forward movement of his body remained at first only in the brain. He turned to push the old man aside, even to strike him down if necessary. Look warm yourself and a coward, rose in his throat, yet found no utterance for in that moment a tall, slim figure, swift as a shadow, steady as a hawk, shot hard across the open space between the forest and the ridge. In the direction of the blazing platform it disappeared against the curtain of thick smoke, emerged for one second in a storm of light, then vanished, finally behind a ruin of loose rocks. And Hendricks, his eyes wounded by heat and wind, his muscles paralyzed, understood that the boy deliberately invited capture. The multitude that hid behind the smoke and the fire, feeding the blazing heaps with eager hands, had become aware of him, and presently would appear to claim him. They would take him to themselves. Already answering flares ran east and west along the desolate ridge. I'll join you. I'm coming. Wait for me, he tried to cry. The uproar smothered it. End of Part 7《Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick Seventy Nine. Story One: The Regeneration of Lord Ernie, Part Eight. And this uproar, he now perceived, was composed entirely of wind and fire. Here, on the roof of the hills beneath a starry sky, these two great elements expressed their nature with an unhampered freedom, for there was neither rain to modify the one, nor a solid obstacle to check the other. Their voices merged in a single sound, the hollow boom of wind and the deep resounding clap of flame. The splitting crackle of burning branches imitated the high, shrill whistle of the tearing gusts that, javelin-like, flew to and fro in darts of swifter sound. 
but one shout rose from the summit, no human cry distinguishable in it, nor amid the thousand lines of skeleton wood that pierced the golden background was any human outline visible. Fire and wind encourage one another to madness, manifesting in prodigious splendour by themselves. Then suddenly, before a gigantic canter of the wind, the driving smoke rolled upwards like a curtain, and the flames, ceasing their wild flappings, soared steadily in Gothic windows of living gold towards the stars. In towering rows between columns of black night, they transformed the empty space between them into a colossal temple aisle. They tapered aloft symmetrically into vanishing crests, and Hendricks stood upright, rising so that his shoulders topped the edge of the boulder, and utterly contemptuous of Lazan's hand that sought with violence to drag him into shelter, he gazed as one who sees a vision. For at first he could only stand and stare, aware of sensation, but not of thought. An enormous, overpowering conviction blew his whole being to white heat. Here was a supply of elemental power that human beings, empty, needy, starved, deficient human beings, could use. His love for the boy leaped along at the skirts of this terrific salvation. A majestic possibility stormed through him. Yet it was no nightmare wonder that met his staring and half-shielded eyes, although some touch of awful dreams seemed in it, set, moreover, to a scale that scantier minds might deem distortion. The heat from some thirty fires placed at regular intervals made midnight quiver with immense vibrations. Of varying yet calculated size, these towering heaps emitted notes of measured and alternating depth, until the roar along the entire produced a definite scale, almost of melody, the near one shrilly singing, those more distant booming with mountainous pedal notes. The consonance was monstrous, yet conformed to some magnificent diapason. This chord of fire music paced the starlit sky, direct but never overmastered by the wind that measured it somehow into meaning. Repeated in quick succession, the notes now crashing in a mass, now singing alone in solitary beauty, the effect suggested an idea of ordered sequence, of gigantic rhythm. It seemed, indeed, as though some controlling agency, mastering excess, coerce both raging elements to express through this stupendous dance some definite idea. Here, as it were, was the alphabet of some natural, undifferentiated language, a language of sight and sound, predating speech, symbolical in the ultimate deific sense. Some lord of fire and some lord of air were in command, harnessed and regulated, these formless cohorts of energy that men call stupidly mere flame and wind, obeyed a higher power that had invoked them, yet a power that, by understanding their laws of being, held them most admirably in control. This, at least, seems a hint of the explanation that flashed into Hendricks, as he stared in amazed bewilderment from the shelter of the nearest boulder. He read a sentence in some natural forgotten script. He watched a primitive ritual that once invoked the gods. He was aware of rhythm, and he was aware of system, though as yet he did not see the hand that wrote this marvellous sentence on the night. For still the human element remained invisible. He only realised, in dim, blundering fashion, that he witnessed a revelation of these two powers which, in large, lie at the foundation of the universe, 
and in little, are the basic essentials of human existence, the powers behind heat and air. Fragments of this talk with Lazan stammered back across his mind, like letters in some stupendous word he dared not reconstruct entire. He shuddered and grew wise. Realms of forgotten being opened their doors before his dazzled sight. Vision fluttered into far, piercing vistas of ancient wonder, haunting and half-remembered, then lost its way in blindness that was pain. For a moment it seemed he was aware of the majestic presences behind the turmoil, shadowy but mighty, charged with a vague potentiality, as of immense algebraical formulae, symbolical and beyond full comprehension, yet willing and able to be used for practical results. He felt the elements as nerves of a living universe, yet thinking was not really in him anywhere. Feeling was all he knew. The world he moved in, as the scripts he read, belonged to conditions too utterly remote for reasons to recover a single clue to their intelligible reconstruction. Glory, clean and strong as of primitive star-worship, passed between what he saw and all that he had ever known before. The curtain of conventional belief was rent in twain. The terrific thing was true. For an unmeasured interval the tutor, oblivious of time and actual place, stood on the brink of this majestic pageant, staring with breathless awe, while the swaying of the entire scenery increased, like the sway of an ocean lifted to the sky by many winds. Then suddenly, in one of those temporary lulls that passed between the beat of the great notes, his searching eyes discovered a new thing. The focus of his sight was altered, and he realized, at last, the source of the directing and controlling power. Behind the fires and beyond the smoke he recognized the disc-like, shining ovals that upon the little earth stand in the image of the one eternal likeness. He saw the human faces, symbols of spiritual dominion over all lesser orders, each one possessed of belief, intelligence, and will. Singly so feeble, together so invincible, this assemblage, unscorched by the fire and by the wind unmoved, seemed to him impressive beyond all possible words and a further inkling of the truth flashed on him as he stared. That a group of humans, a crowd, combining upon a given object with concentrated purpose, possessed of that terrific power, certain faith, may know in themselves the energy, and move mountains, and therefore that lesser energy to guide the fluid forces of the elements and a sense of cosmic exaltation leaped into his being. For a moment he knew a touch of almost frenzy. Proud joy rose in him like a splendor of omnipotence. Humanity, it seemed to him, here came into a grand but long-neglected corner of its kingdom, as originally planned by heaven into the hands of a weakling and deficient boy the guidance had been given. Motionless beneath the stars, lit by the glare till they shone like idols of yellow stone, and magnified by the sheets of flying, intolerable light, the wind chased to and fro, these rows of faces appeared at first as a single line of undifferentiated fire against the background of the night. The eyes were all cast down in prayer, each mind focused steadily upon one clear idea, the control and assimilation of two elemental powers. The crowd was one, feeling was one, desire, command, and certain faith were one. 
the controlling power that resulted was irresistible. Then came a remarkable, concerted movement. With one accord, the eyes all opened, blazing with reflected fire. A hundred human countenances rose in a single shining line. The men stood upright, swarthy faces, tanned by the sun and wind, heads uncovered, hair and beards tossing in the air, turned all one way. Mouths opened, too. There came a roar that even the hurricane could not drown. A word of command, it seemed, that sprang into the pulses of the dancing elements and reduced their turmoil to a wave of steadier movement. And at the same moment a hundred bodies, naked above the waist, arms outstretched and hands with the palms held upwards, swayed forward through the smoke and fire. They came towards the spot where, half concealed from view, the tutor crouched and watched. And Hendricks, thinking himself discovered, first quailed, then rose to meet them. No power to resist was in him. It was rather willing response that he experienced. He stepped out from the shelter of the boulder and entered the brilliant glare. Hatless himself, shoulders squared, cloak flying in the wind, he took three strides towards the advancing battalion. Then, undecided, paused. For the line he saw disregarded him as though he were not there at all. It was not him the worshippers sought. The entire troop swept past to a point some fifty feet below where the edge of the ridge broke out of the thinning trees. Beautiful as a curving wave of flame, the figures streamed across the narrow open space with a drilled precision as of some battle line, and Hendricks, with a sense of wild, secret triumph, saw them pause at the brink of the platform ridge, form up their serried ranks, yet closer, then open two hundred arms to welcome someone whom the darkness should immediately deliver. Simultaneously, from the covering trees, the tall, slim shadow of Lord Ernie darted out into the light. Magnificent! cried Hendricks, but his voice was smothered instantly in a mightier sound, and his movement forward seemed ineffective and stumbling. The hundred voices thundered out a single note. And like a deer, the boy leaped. Like a tongue of flame, he flew to join his own, and instantly was surrounded, borne shoulder-high upon those upturned palms, swept back in triumph towards the procession of enormous fires. Wrapped by smoke and sparks, lifted by wind, he became part of the monstrous rhythm that turned the mountain ridge alive. He stood upright upon the platform of the interlacing arms. He swayed with their movement as a thing of wind and fire that flew. The shining faces vanished then, turned all towards the blazing pals, so that the boy had the appearance of standing on a wall of living black. His outline was visible a moment against the sky, firelight between the wide stretched legs, streaming from his hair and horizontal arms, issuing almost, as it seemed, from his very body. The next second he leaped to the ground, ran forward, appallingly close, between two heaped-up fires, flung both hands heavenwards, and knelt. And Hendricks, sympathetically following the boy's performance, as though his own mind and body took part in it, experienced then a singular result. It seemed the heart in him began to roar. This was no rustle of excited blood that the little cavern of his skull increased, but a deeper sound that proclaimed the kinship of his entire being with the ritual. His own nature had begun to answer. From that moment he perceived the spectacle, not with the senses of sight and hearing, separately, but with his entire body, synthetically. 
he became a part of this assembly that was itself one single instrument, a cosmic sounding board for the rhythmical expression of impersonal nature powers. Lazan, he dimly realized, fixed in his churchy tenets, remained outside, apart, and compromising. Hendricks accepted and went with. All little customary feelings dipped utterly away, lost, false, denied, even as a unit in a crowd loses its normal characteristics in the greater mood that sways the whole. The fire no longer burned him, for he was the fire, nor did he stagger against the furious wind, because the wind was in his heart. He moved all over, alive in every point and corner. With his skin he breathed, his bones and tissue ran with glorious heat. He cried aloud, he praised, I am the whirlwind, and I am the fire, fire that lights that but does not burn, and wind that blows the heart to flame. His body sang it, or rather the element sang it through his body, for the sound of his voice was not audible, and it was wind and fire that thundered forth his feelings in their crashing rhythm. End of Part 8 Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Patrick79 Story 1. The Regeneration of Lord Ernie Part 9 and so it was that he no longer saw this thing pictorially, nor in the little detached reports the individual senses brought, but he knew it in himself complete, as a man who knows love and passion. Memory, afterwards, translated these vast central feelings into pictures, but the picture touched reality without containing it. Like a vision, it happened all at once, as a room or landscape happens, and what happens all at once, coming through a synthesis of senses, is not properly describable later. To instantaneous knowledge, mere sequence is a falsehood. The sequence first comes in with the telling afterwards. That kneeling form, he understood, was the empty vessel to which conventional life had hitherto denied the heat and air it craved, the breath of life now poured at full tide into it. The fire of deity lit its heart of touchwood. Wind blew into desire. And later flame would burst forth in action, consuming opposition. He must let it fill to the brim. It was not salvation, but creation. Then thought went out extinguished by a puff of something greater. For beyond the smoke and sparks, beyond the space the men had occupied, a new and gentler movement, lyrical with bird-like beauty, ran suddenly along the ridge. What Hendricks had taken for branches heaped in rows for the burning, stirred marvellously throughout their whole collective mass, stirred sweetly too, and with an exquisite loveliness. The entire line rose gracefully into the air with a whirr, as of sweeping birds. There was a soft and undulating motion as though a draught of flowing wind turned faintly visible, yet with an increasing brilliance, like shining lilies of flame that now flocked forward in a troop, bending deliciously all one way, and in the same second those tall lilies of fire revealed themselves as figures, naked above the waist, hair streaming on the wind, eyes alight and bare arms waving. Above the men's deep-pedalled bass 
their voices rose with clear, shrill sweetness of the storm. The band swept forward swift as wind towards the kneeling boy. The long line curved about him foldingly. The women took him as the south wind takes a bird. There may have been, indeed, there was, an interval, for Hendrick's court again and again repeated the boy's great cry of passionate delight above the tumult. Ringing and virile it rose to heaven, clear as a fine-wrought bell, and instantaneously the knitted figures of flame disentangled themselves again. The mass unfolded like an opening flower, and as by the military word of command dissolved itself once more into a long thin line of running fire. The women advanced, and the waiting men flowed forward in a stream to meet them. This interweaving of the figures was as easily as accomplished as the mingling of light and heavy threads upon some living loom. Hands joining hands, all singing, these naked worshippers of fire and wind passed in and out among the blazing piles with a headlong precision that was torrential and yet orderly. The speed increased, the faces flashed and vanished, then flashed and passed again. Each woman between two men, each man between two women, and Lord Ernie, radiantly alive between two girls of rich, overflowing beauty. Their movements were undulating, like the undulations of fire, yet with sudden, unexpected upward leaps, as when a fire is partnered abruptly by a cantering wind. For the women were fire, and the men were wind. The imitative dance was in full swing, the marvellous wind and fire ritual unrolled its old-world magic. It was awe-inspiring, certainly, but for Hendricks, as he watched, the terror of big conflagrations was wholly absent. Rather, he felt the sense of deep security that rhythmic movement causes. Bathed in a sea of elemental power, he burned to share the pagan splendour and the rush of primitive delight. He seemed he had a cosmic body in which new centres stirred to life, linking him on this source of natural forces. Through these centres he drew the chaotic energy into nerves and blood and muscle, into the very substance of his thought, indeed transmuting them into the magic of the will. Abundant and inexhaustible vigour filled the air, pouring freely into whatever empty receptacle lay at hand. Sheets of flame, whole separate fragments of it, torn at the edges, raced loudly, hungrily, flapping on the vehement gusts of winds, curved as they flew, leaped, twisted, flashed, and vanished, and the figures closely copied them. The women tossed their bodies aloft, then dipped suddenly to the earth, invisible, till the rushing men urged them into view again with wild, impetuous swing, so that the entire line stretched and contracted like an immense elastic band of life, now knotted, now dissolved. Yet, while of raging and terrific beauty, there was never that mad abandon which is disorder but rather a kind of sacred, natural revel that prohibited mere license. There was even a singular austerity in it that portrayed a definite ritual, and not mere reckless pageantry. No walls could possibly have contained it. In cathedral, temple, or measured space, however grand, it could only seem exaggerated and apostate. Here, beneath the open sky, it was beautiful and true. For overhead the stars burned clear and steady, the constellations watching it from their immovable towers, a representation of their own leisured and hierarchic dance in swifter miniature. 
and indeed this relationship it bore to a universal rhythm was the key it seemed to its deep significance for the close imitation of natural movements seduced the colossal powers of fire and wind to swell human emotions till they became mould and vessel for the elemental manifestation in men and women gold and yellow in the blaze the limbs of the women flashed and passed their hair flew dark a moment across their gleaming breasts and their waving arms tossed in ever-shifting patterns through the driving smoke the fires boiled and roared scattered torrents of showering sparks like stars and amid it all the slim white shoulders of the boy his clothes torn from him his eyes ablaze and his lips open to the singing as though he had known it always drove to and fro on the crest of the ritual like some flying figure of wind and fire incarnate all of which instantaneously yet in sequence Hendricks witnessed painted upon the wild night sky a volcanic energy poured through him too he knew a golden enthusiasm of immeasurable strength of unconquerable hope of irresistible delight wind set his feet to dancing and fire swept across his face without a trace of burning nature was part of him he had stepped inside no obstacle existed that could withstand for a single second the torrential energy that filled his heart and blood there was lightning in his veins he could sweep aside life's difficult barriers with the ease of a tornado and shake the rubbish of doubt and care from the years of earthquake shocks empires he could mould and play with nations drive men and women before him like a flock of sheep shatter convention and dislocate the machinery time has foisted upon natural energies he knew in himself the omnipotence of the lesser elemental deities yet a sympathetic observer he can but have felt a tithe of what lord ernie felt we are the whirlwind and we are the fire he cried aloud with the rushing worshippers we are unconquerable and immense we destroy the lukewarm and absorb the weak for we can make evil into good by bending it all one way the roar swept thunderingly past him catching at his voice and body he felt himself snatched forward by the wind the fire licked sweetly at him it was the final abandonment he plunged recklessly towards the surge of dancers end of part nine incredible adventures by algernon blackwood this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by patrick 79 story 1 the regeneration of lord ernie part 10 what stopped him he did not know some hard and steely thing pricked sharply into him an opposing power fierce as a sword stabbed at his heart and he heard a little sound quite close to him a sound that pierced the babble reaching his consciousness as from far away keep still cling tight to this old rock hold yourself in or they'll have you too it was as if some insect scratched within his ear his arm that same instant was violently seized he came down with a crash he had been half in the air he had been dancing turn your eyes away away take hold of this big tree the voice cried furiously but with a petty human passion in it that marred the world 
there was an intolerable revulsion in him as he heard it. He felt himself dragged forcibly backwards. He lost his balance, stumbling among loose stones. "'Loose me! Let me go!' he shouted, struggling like a wild animal, yet vainly against the inflexible grip that held him. "'I am the one with the fire that lights but does not burn. I am the wind that blows the world along. Damnation take you! Let me free!' Confusion caught him, smothering speech and blinding sight. He fell backwards, away from the heat and the wind. He was furious, but furious with he knew not whom or what. The interference had destroyed the rhythm, broken it into fragments. Violent impulses crashed through him without the will to choose or guide him for power had deserted him and flowed elsewhere. He stood no longer in the stream of energy. He was emptied, and at first he could not tell whether his instinct was to return to himself, to rescue his precious boy, or to crush the interfering object out of existence with what was left of him and his raging anger. He turned, stood up, and flung the pastor aside with violence. He raised his feet to stamp and kill, when a phrase with meaning darted suddenly across his wild confusion and recalled him to some fragment of truer responsibility and life. There'll be only violence in him, reckless violence instead of strength, destructive. Save him before it's too late. "'It is too late,' he roared in answer. "'What devil hinders me?' But his roar was feeble, and his ironed boots refused the stamping. Power slips wholly out of him. The rhythm poured past instead of through him. Interference had destroyed the circuit. More glimmerings of responsibility came back. He stooped like a drunken man, and helped the other to his feet. The rapidity of change was curious, proving that the spell had been put upon him from without. It was not, as with the boy, mere development of pre-existing tendencies. "'Help me!' he implored suddenly instead. "'Help me! There has been madness in me! For God's sake, help me to get him out!' It seemed the face of the old Marquis, stern and terrible, broke an instant through the smoky air, black with reproach and anger, and with a violent effort of the will Hendricks turned round to face the elemental orgy, bent on rescue. But this time the heat was intolerable and drove him back. The hair, hitherto untouched, now singed upon his head. Fire licked his very breath away, he bent double, covering his face with arms and cloak. "'Pray!' shouted Lazan, dropping to his knees. "'It is the only way. My God is higher than this. Pray! Pray!' And automatically Hendricks fell upon his knees beside him, though to pray he knew not how, for no real faith was in him as in the other, and his eye was far from single. The fast-fading grandeur of what he had experienced still left its pagan tumult in his blood. The pretense of prayer could only have been blasphemy. He watched instead, letting the other invoke his mighty deity alone. That deity he had served unflinchingly all his life with faith and fasting, and with belief beyond assault. It was an impressive picture fraught with passionate drama. On his knees behind sheltering boulder, a blackened pine tree tossing scorched branches above his head, this righteous man prayed to his God, sure of his triumphant answer. Hendricks watched with an admiration that made him realize his own insignificance. The eyes were closed, the leonine big head set firm upon the diminutive body, 
the face now lit by flame, now veiled by smoke, the strong hands clasped together and upraised. Oh, he envied him. He recognized, too, that the elements themselves, with all their chaos of might and terror, were after all but servants of the vastness which dips the butterfly in color and puts down upon the breasts of little robins. And, because the pastor's life had always been prayer in action, his little human will invoked the will of greatness, merged with it, used it, and directed it steadily against the commotion of these unleashed elements. Certain of himself and of his God, the pastor never doubted. His prayer set instantly in action those forces which balance suns and keep the stars afloat. Thus, trembling with terror that made him wholly ineffective, Hendricks watched, and as he watched became aware of the amazing change, for it seemed as if a stream of power, steady and in opposition to the tumult, now poured audaciously against the elemental rhythm, altering its direction, modifying gradually its stupendous impetus. There were pauses in the huge vibrations. They wavered, broke, and fled. They knew confusion, as when the prow of a steel-nosed vessel drives against the tide. The tide is vaster, but the steel is different. The whole sky shivered as this new entering force, so small, so soft, yet so much incalculable energy, began at once its overmastering effect. Signs of violence, or rout, or of anything disordered, had no part in it. Excess, before it slipped into willing harness, there was light that sponged away all glare, as when morning sunshine cleans a forest of its shadows. Some little whispering power sang marvellously as of old across the desolate big mountains. Peace! Be still! turning the monstrous turbulence into obedient sweetness. And upon his face and hands Hendricks felt faint, delicate touches of some refreshing softness that he could not understand. Yet not instantly was his harmony restored. At first there was stress of vehement opposition. The night of wind and fire drove roaring through the sky. There were bursts of triumphant tumult, but convulsion in them, and no steadiness as before. The human figures hitherto had danced with that fluid appearance which belongs to fire, and with that instantaneous rush which is of the wind, the men increasing the women, and the women answering with joy. Limbs and faces had melted into each other, till the circular ritual looked like a glowing wheel of flame rotating audibly. But slowly, now the speed of the wheel decreased. The single utterance was marred by the crying of many voices, all at different pitch, discordant, inharmonious, dismayed. The fires somehow dwindled. There came pauses in the wind, and Hendricks became aware of a curious hissing noise, as more and more of these odd soft touches found his face and hands. Here and there he saw a figure stumbled, fell, then gathered himself clumsily together again with a frightened shout, breaking violently out of the circle. More and more of these figures blundered and dropped out, and although they returned again, so that the dance apparently increased, there were but moments in the final violence of the dispersing hurricane. The rejected ones dashed back wildly into the wrong places. Men and women no longer stood alternate, but in groups together falsely related. The entire movement was dislocated. The ceremony grew rapidly incoherent. Meaning forsook it. 
the composite instrument that had transmuted the elemental forces into human emotional storage was imperfect, broken, out of tune. The disarray turned rout. And then it was, while Lezan continued without ceasing his burning and successful prayer, that his companion, conscious of returning harmony, rose to his feet aware suddenly that he could also help. A portion of the powers he had absorbed still worked in him, but in a new direction. He felt confident and unafraid. He did not stumble. With unerring tread he advanced towards the lessening fires, feeling as he did so the cold soft touches multiply with the rush upon his skin. From all sides they came, like messengers of help. Ernest, he cried aloud, and his voice, though little raised, carried resonantly above the dying turmoil. Ernest, come back to us. Your father calls you. And from three score faces hurrying in confusion through the smoke, one paused and turned. It stood apart, hovering as though in air, while the mob of disordered figures rushed in a body along the ridge, plunging like frightened cattle below the farther edge. Then vanishing into thick darkness, they left behind them this one solitary face. A final dying flame licked out at it. A rush of smoke drove past to hide it. There was a high, wild scream and the figure shot forward with a headlong leap and fell with a crash at Hendrick's feet. Lord Ernie, blackened by smoke and scorched by fire, lay safe outside the danger zone. And Hendricks knelt beside him. Remorse and shame made him powerless to do more as he pulled the torn clothing over the neck and chest and heard his own heart begging for forgiveness. He realized his own weakness and faithlessness. A great temptation had found him wanting. It was owing to Lazan that the rescue was complete. The pastor was instantly by his side. Saved as by water, he cried, as he folded his cloak about the prostrate body and then raised the head and shoulders. Saved by his ministers of rain, for his miracles are love, and work through natural laws. He made a sign to Hendricks. Carrying the boy between them, they scrambled down the slope in the shelter of the trees below. The cold, soft touches were then explained. The Joran had dropped as suddenly as it rose, and the torrential rain that invariably follows now poured in rivers from the sky. Water, drenching the fires and padding the savage wind, had stopped the dancers midway in their frenzied ritual. It was the element they dreaded, for it was hostile. Rain soused the mountain's ridge, extinguishing the last embers of the numerous fires. It rushed in rivulets between their feet. The heated earth gave out a hissing steam, and the only sound in the spaces where wind and fire had boomed and thundered a little while before was now the splash of water and the drip of quenching drops. In the cover of the sheltering trees the body stirred, lifted its head, and sat up slowly. The eyes opened. I I'm cold. I I'm frightened, whispered a shivering voice. Where am I? Only the pelt and thud of the rain sounded behind the quavering words. Where are the others? Have I been away? Hendricks, Mr. Hendricks, is that you? He stared about him, his face now a mere luminous disk in the thick darkness. No breath of wind was loose. 
they spoke to him till he answered with assurance, groping to find their hands with his own, his words confused and strange with hidden meaning for a time. I I'm all right now, he kept repeating. I know exactly. It was one of my big dreams. I suppose I fell asleep, I and the rain woke me. Great heavens! Oh, what a night to be out! And then he clambered vigorously to his feet, with a sudden movement of a great energy again, saying that hunger was in him, and he must eat. There was no complaint of heat or cold, of burning or of bruises. The boy recovered marvellously. Well, in ten minutes, breaking away from all support, he led, as they descended through the dripping forest in the gloom and chill of very early morning. It was the others who called to him for guidance in the tangled wood. Lord Ernie was in the lead. Throughout the difficult woods he was ever in front and singing. Fire that lights that does not burn, the wind that blows the heart to flame, they both are in me now for ever and ever. Oh, praise the Lord of fire and the Lord of wind. And this voice, now near, now distant, sounding through the dripping forest on their homeward journey, was an experience weird and unforgettable for those other two. Lazan, it seemed, had one sentence only which he kept repeating to himself. Heaven grant you may direct it all for good, for they have filled him to the brim, and he is become an instrument of power. But Hendricks, though he understood the risk, felt only confidence. Lord Ernie's regeneration had begun. Soaked and bedraggled, all three, they reached the village about two o'clock. The boy, utterly unmanageable, said an emphatic no to spirit, soup, or medical appliances. His skin, indeed, showed no signs of burning, nor was there the smallest symptom of cold or fever in him. "'I am a perfect furnace,' he laughed. "'I feel health and strength personified.' and the brightness of his eyes, his radiant colour, the vigour of his voice and manner, both in some way astonishing, made all pretence of assistance unnecessary and absurd. "'It's like a new birth!' he cried to Hendricks, as he almost cantered beside him down the road to their house. "'And by Jove! I'll wake him up at home and make the world go round!' I know a hundred schemes. I tell you, sir, I'm simply bursting. For the first time, I'm alive. And an hour later, when the tutor peeped in upon him, the boy was calmly sleeping. The candlelight, shaded carefully with one hand, fell upon his face. There were new lines and a new expression in it. Will and purpose showed in the stern set of the lips and jaw. It was the face of a man, and of a man one would not lightly trifle with. Purpose, will and power were established on their thrones. To such a man the entire world might one day bow the head. If only it will last, thought Hendricks, as shaken, bewildered, and more than a little awed, he tiptoed out of the room again and went to bed. But through his dreams, sheeted in flame and veiled in angry smoke, the face of the old Marquis glowered upon him from a heavy sky above the ancestral towers. End of Part 10 Incredible Adventures by Algernon Blackwood This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick seventy nine. Story one: The regeneration of Lord Ernie. Part eleven. From the obituary notices of the ninth Marquess of Oakham, the following selections have their interest. He succeeded to his father, then in the cabinet as Minister of Foreign Affairs, at the age of twenty-one. His career was brief but singular. The early magnificence of the younger Pitt, offering a standard of comparison, though by no means a parallel, to his short record of astonishing achievement. His effect upon the world, first as the chief of the government labor department, and subsequently as the home secretary and minister of war, is described as shattering, even cataclysmic. His public life lasted five years. He died at the age of twenty-nine. His personality was revolutionary and overwhelming. For judging by these extracts, he was a Napoleonic figure whose personal influence combined the impetus of Marabo and the dominance of Alexander. His authority held an incalculable element, precisely described as uncanny. His spirit was puissant, elemental, his activity irresistible. Yet according to another journal, he was, properly speaking, neither intellectual, astute, nor diplomatic, and possessed as little subtlety as might be expected of a minor whose psychology was called upon to explain the Trinity. In no sense was he statesman, and even less strategist, yet his name swept Europe, changed the map of the nearer East, its mere whisper among the chancelleries convulsing men's counsels with an influence almost menacing. His enthusiasm appears to have been amazing. Some stupendous and untiring energy drove through him, paralyzing attack and rendering the bitterest and most skilful opposition nugatory. His hand was imperious upsetting with a touch the chessboard set by the most able statecraft, and his voice was heard with a kind of reverence in every capital. The brevity of his astonishing career called for universal comment, as did the hypnotizing effect of his singular ascendancy. In five short years of power he achieved his sway. He rushed upon the world, he shook it, he retired, as one journal picturesquely phrased it. The manner of his ending, moreover, a stroke of lightning, seemed to be in keeping with his life. There was neither lingering, delay, nor warning. Of distinguished stock, noble, yet ordinary enough in all but name, his power is unexplained by hereditary. His family furnished no approach to greatness as history supplied no parallel to his dynamic intensity. Nor, we are informed, among his near kin does any inherit his volcanic energy. The world, however, was apparently well relieved of his tumultuous presence, for his influence was generally surveyed as destructive rather than constructive. He was unmarried, and the title went to a nephew. The cheaper journals abounded, of course, in details of his personal and private life that were freely copied into the foreign press, and supply curious material for the student of human nature and the psychologist. The amazing revelations, no doubt, were picturesquely exaggerated, yet the substratum of truth in them all was generally admitted. No contradictions, at any rate, appeared. They read like the story of some primitive, wild giant let loose upon the world, primitive because his specific brain power was admittedly of no high order, wild because he was in favour of fierce, spontaneous action, 
and his mere presence on occasions could stir a nation, not alone a crowd, to vehement, terrific methods. His energy seemed inexhaustible, his fire inextinguishable. Legends were rife, even before he died, among the peasantry of his Scotch estates, that he was in league with the devil. His habit of keeping enormous fires in his private rooms, fires that burned day and night from January to December, and in open hearths widened to thrice their natural size, stimulated the growth of this particular myth among those of his personal environment. All manner of stories raged. But it was his strange custom out of doors that provided the diabolical suggestion. For behind a special walled-in place on an open ridge, denuded of pines in a distant part of the estate, a series of gigantic heaps of wood, all ready to ignite, were, it was said, kept in a state of constant preparedness, and on stormy nights, especially when winds were high, and invariably at the period of the equinoctial tempest, his lordship would himself light those tremendous bonfires, and spend the nocturnal hours in their blazing presence, communing, the stories variously relate, with the witches of their Sabbath, or with hordes of fire-spirits, who emerged from the bottomless pit in order to feed his soul with the unquenchable supplies. From these nightly orgies it seems clear, at any rate, he returned at dawn with a splendour of energy that no one could resist, and with a mane whose grandeur invited worship rather than inspired alarm. His biography, it was further stated, would be written by Sir John Hendricks, Bart, who began life as private secretary to his father, the eighth Marquess, but whose rapid rise to position was due to his intimate association as trusted friend and adviser to the subject of these obituary notices. The biography, however, had not appeared. Within five years of Lord Oakham's sudden death, and curiosity is only further stimulated by the suggestive whisper that it never will, and never can appear. End of The Regeneration of Lord Ernie by Algernon Blackwood